welcome guys. Uh, sorry, extremely sorry for the delay. Uh, there were some technical issues. Now that is solved. Uh, uh, it it has been a wonderful day today. Uh, India won uh, all the matches and uh, qualified to quarter final. Big day for celebration. Uh, today I have got a very special guest. Uh, he uh, he broke. Uh, he became youngest grandmaster by breaking uh, Jurit Polgar's record. He won tournaments like uh, Linares, Waikanzi, Tal Memorial, Dortmund, Grand Prix. Uh, he played the World Championship match uh, with Kramnik. He was uh, just one game away from becoming world champion. He has been in the elite group for ages. Uh, a fantastic human being, a great player, a great personality. Let us welcome my friend Peter Leko. Hello, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Sulia. Very nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, I know. I know you have been doing a lot of commentary, and uh, your schedule is uh, very, very uh, hectic, if I may say so. And you are also training with Vincent. Uh, generally, you are extremely busy. So thanks for uh, giving giving time to us. Yeah, I'm also very happy. It worked out, of course. Yeah, this uh, Magnus Chess Tour had been a fantastic event. It was a pleasure to be in the commentating team. Also, it was a pleasure to be playing in the Legends Tournament. Right. It was just a very nice feeling, but it really made my life uh, very, very busy lately. Yes, yes. Uh, by the way, uh, Peter, today, did you get a chance to follow the games today uh, of Olympiad? We had some very nice performance in general. We... Yes, well, I mean, the, to be honest, I was only waiting for the match between uh, China and India. Yeah, it felt like this right. is the decisive match. I simply believe that the te two teams are so strong that they will beat beat all their uh, concurrents. Mm -hmm. Actually, I thought that that was maybe the toughest group. I That's, felt it was yeah. really, yeah, yeah, very tough. I mean, because all these uh, teams like Georgia, Germany, are very dangerous, of course. Germany also very solid, yeah, it's so many great players, so it's, uh, okay, on the other hand, okay, India and China, they yeah, are yeah. like two, two superpowers, so probably the other teams are also complaining. I Iran, okay, Iran. We got, yeah, Iran, exactly, yeah, yeah. of course, now without Filuza, it's uh, not the same, but yeah, of course, always a very dangerous uh, team. Right, right, but uh, yeah, the, there were many uh, dramatic moments, but actually everybody played really well, especially our juniors, they did fantastic job. And it's a great feeling that we now we don't have to play any more matches. We just we're sitting in quarterfinal, and we're relaxed a bit. We, that it actually gives yeah, some time course. at least, yeah. Right. Yeah, of course. But I mean, it's I think uh, not such a big surprise. No, that Praga is kind of dominating his. Yeah, yeah. Praga uh, is killing completely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, junior award. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Peter, you started playing chess uh, at very uh, early age. Uh, the first time I remember seeing you was, uh, I saw you, I think, in uh, 92 Duisburg or 94 Hungary. I, I don't remember exactly where, but th this is the image that I that I have. Like, uh, I don't yeah. know. This is from Duisburg. Yeah? I mean, this is from Duisburg, yeah. Duisburg 92, 92. and it's in fact the last last run against uh, Tikhonov. Uh, because it was very funny. I won this last game against Tikhonov, but and I catched him because he was one point ahead. Mm -hmm. However, the direct encounter was not important. Right. And since at the very start of the World Junior Championship, I mean, it was uh, under 14. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lost I lost, and I drew a couple of games at the beginning. And then I started to do the catch up. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I was winning this uh, final duel. But uh, for the tiebreak system, it didn't matter. So I, I couldn't take the podium. Right, right. Uh, then you also played in Hungary, right? In Seged also in 94, uh, you as well played there, right? Yes, I mean, finally in 94 in Seged, uh, I won the under 16. It was the first time that finally I won mm -hmm. because uh, I, I don't remember what something like three or four times I shared first place mm -hmm. and I never managed to win on tie breaks. Uh, I, I think it was also connected. You know that uh, I was already playing in very strong tournaments mm -hmm. and uh, I was hardly between other kids. So when whenever this World Youth Championship would start, then suddenly 
I would be destructive. We would be going to play football. I mean, suddenly I was among the children and I was children myself. So, you know, and then first runs, I always played somehow very badly. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I suddenly took it seriously, then I already had the wrong tie break system because uh, it was the progressive system. Yeah, in yes, all these four yes. juniors, the progressive, which in my opinion made absolutely no sense because why the first round is more important than, than the decisive clashes. Mm-hmm. But I fell victim of this even in Seged when uh, we played in 94, I lost round two. Mm-hmm. And after that, it was, it was only nine rounds. So I knew that I have to win basically all my games. Uh, to to finally win it, and I managed to score eight out of nine. Yeah, that was uh, that was pleasing, and I never ever played again. Yeah, it was yes, like enough. Yes, you know? yes. So I I remember one very funny conversation with you. This happened a couple of years back. Uh, I think this happened during uh, one of the Anand's uh, training session for World Championship match, and at some point we were walking in this uh, Batsodan, and uh, I think I asked you, would you uh, will you play some open tournament? And then I got to know for a long period of time, your last open tournament was World, num- uh, World Under 14 in Seged. After that... Yeah, World Under 16. World Under 16. 16. That was Under 16, yes. What was the next open tournament you played after World Under 16? This I'm very curious to know. One second, like the audience also should know. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, the next one was uh, actually the, the Isle of Man tournament in 2016. <laughs> I think that's, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, after 94, then I finally in 2016, I got to play an Open in Isle of Man and it was it was great. I mean, the organizer is very, very kind and I just love this place. So it it was, uh, it also became my only Open tournament, which I was there regularly playing each year. Right. No, I would, I would, I would never forget this con- epic conversation which I had. So I, I think I asked you, why don't you play a Qatar, Qatar Open or something? And then you were like, how how do I play? Should I try to organize it that I want to play? Because I have never done such thing. I've never played open tournaments for like 22 years. This was uh, epic. Yeah, and actually because somehow this word use tournaments, I don't even uh, consider like open tournaments. Yeah, they are like word use and okay, that's a championship. But right. if I just uh, try to remember when was my last real open tournament, I mean, not rapid, but uh, classical, I think it was in Australia, in Sydney, uh, 92 December, end of December, start of 93 in January. That was a that was a fantastic event, you know, because also it it's supposed to be a continental championship, mm-hmm. and uh, I was just uh, 13 years old mm-hmm. at that at that moment, and uh, and then people were like, you know, shocked that how a 13 year old boy is almost about to win. Uh, the Australian Open. But for me personally, I took second place behind Ian Rogers and uh, we had a big, big fight for first place. But finally, okay, he, he was more experienced and probably even he, he deserved even better because he was uh, more stable. And he won the event. I was second and I felt like I failed because I wanted to win very much, you know. Okay. Exactly. I traveled to Australia. I had all this wonderful... Uh, uh, memories there, all these experiences, meeting kangaroos, uh, going to the beach. I mean, we were having some boat rides and whatsoever, playing tennis. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I very much wanted to win it, but yeah, I, I only took second place. Right. Uh, for the audience, those uh, who are curious, like why Peter never played an open tournament? Well, the reason is very simple. At very early age, uh, Peter reached absolute top. And then he was playing only the tournaments where, you know, uh, even to get chance to play at those tournaments is like extremely difficult. People cannot even play. Uh, for uh, I mean, there are very few players who are able to play tournaments like uh, uh, Linares or Dortmund or Wykenzie. And Peter was doing this at the very early age. Uh, Peter, you became Grandmaster. Uh, when you became Grandmaster, you were the youngest one, right? Judith bo- broke Fisher's record and then you broke Judith's record. Exactly, that's right. I mean, it was in 94 in Vikanze. Mm-hmm. So it was just one year later than I came back from, from Australia. And also in 93 already, I played a tournament in Leon. Mm-hmm. It was the so-called first uh, super tournament of my life with uh, players like Karpov, Topalov. I mean, Yudasin back then was a world candidate. Uh, 
Vishmanav was also very good. ESK, I mean, uh, playing against all these guys there was like uh, a dream come true. Uh -huh. That's when I made my second Grandmaster Norm, uh -huh. actually. Uh, and uh, the final Grandmaster Norm I made in uh, Vaikanze, right. uh, in a very, 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 very strong field. I mean, back then, those guys were all like top top 30 players. I mean, Ivan Sokolov, I won against Ivan Sokolov, I won against Ivan Morovic. Those were my two victories with the black pieces, but uh, I lost first round to Tivyakov. I mean, Tivyakov was super strong back then, also a world candidate. Uh, you know, Piquet was there, uh, Pledak, Nikolic, I mean, all these, all these guys, uh -huh. uh, Ilya Smidin. And it was also very funny because I was trying to get the third Grandmaster Norm, the final Grandmaster Norm, and the rating average of the tournament was 25.99.4. Uh -huh. I mean, the worst, the worst possible because, okay, just add one more uh, fraction of point and it will be 2600 and then you only need 50 percent like this i needed plus one in this very very strong field mm -hmm. so i felt like i don't believe that there is any tournament in the world history where making a grandmaster norm was more tough than than in that specific tournament absolutely absolutely <clears throat> peter uh... So once again to the audience, like uh, I have been to Peter's house. We had a fantastic training camp. We played lots of games apart from chess also. And uh, I happened to see how, what sort of prices, uh, price trophies Peter has in his house. And those who are not aware, Peter is actually a very private person. He is not in, on any social network. And even to contact Peter, you can either contact him in Skype or by email. He's not on Twitter. He's not on Instagram. He's not on Facebook. A fantastic personality, but uh, when it comes to digital world, he is completely aloof from everything. <laughs> you know, Peter, today I tweeted about uh, our show, but I could not tag you. And whenever I'm tweeting you, I always write Peter Leko, who cannot be tagged. Who cannot be tagged <laughs> anywhere. So I took some uh, photos of uh, Peter's uh, prizes when I was there. And it took, uh, friends, it took a lot of time for me to convince him that I can show some of them because he is, he is not a person who will brag about himself. So I, I managed to convince him uh, to show some of the some of his pictures. This is probably what you are seeing is like, uh, I don't know, 20% of uh, the trophies. But uh, let's see, what are these trophies? There is Linares on the extreme left corner. Exactly. I mean, this Linares is just a very, very special trophy because uh, Linares is like the Wimbledon of chess. So winning that tournament ahead of Kasparov, uh, okay, I shared with Kramnik, so it's uh, more correct to say that, yes, we won with Kramnik, I won on tie breaks. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Kasparov and uh, Vishyanand shared the third, fourth place. Right. Yeah, it was a dream come true. I mean, this uh, winning Linares is something very, very special. It's like the unofficial world championship. So having this trophy, I have played in that tournament a uh, couple of times, many times in fact, and uh, usually Kasparov was holding that trophy at the end of the tournament. So it was very nice feeling, you know, that now it belongs to me. Right. And then there is uh, these two trophies. These are probably from, uh, if I remember correctly, one is from Grand Prix, right? Dubai. Yes, the the very big one is from, from the Dubai Grand Prix 2002 when I won the FIDA Grand Prix rapid FIDA Grand Prix in Dubai uh -huh. in the final game, this legendary uh, final against Grishchuk. I mean, where we had this Armageddon ah, game yes, and yes. okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, finally it got down to, to flagging at the end. Yeah, this Armageddon is just a terrible thing. I mean, I hate this because usually you like to be a sportsman uh -huh. and you don't like to win on time, but somehow Armageddon forces you because if you just agree to a draw, uh -huh. then then you are the loser so it's it's a brutal brutal format we have also seen now in uh, the magnus tour that usually people were always complaining when a match finally was decided by armageddon nobody likes to decide it like this on the other hand we also played a marathon match there was no we just couldn't uh, get a winner and finally we had to decide some way right then there is the famous Dortmund, two, uh, Dortmund 2002, which you won and uh, you qualified for the World Championship match against Kramnik. Yes, well, first I would go back to the previous picture because there is another trophy there next to the Dubai Grand Prix trophy. That uh -huh. was my very first Super Tournament victory. So it's a very, very 
uh, pleasant memory, the mm -hmm. Dortmund Trophy from 99. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I won a Super Tournament and basically thanks to this victory, I started belonging absolutely to the, to the very best elite. Uh -huh. uh, I broke into the top 10 in the world ranking after this tournament and uh, I remained there for 10 years consecutively. Right, right. right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just uh, also tell the trophies here. Dortmund 2002 is when Peter won Dortmund and then uh, by virtue of that he qualified to play against match against Kramnik. Uh, the last one in the uh, corner, that is, uh, that's a very special one, that is uh, Dresden Olympiad. Uh, which happened immediately after Anand Kramnik match and Peter was uh, in the Kramnik team and he won the gold medal and only only those who have worked they know how much energy it takes to work as seconds and then to play a tournament like Olympia and to win a gold is absolutely uh, phenomenal. Yeah, it was it was very special. Of course, after the match in Bonn, I was completely dead. I think there was like one week between the match and uh, and the Olympiad. I was I was just lying at in the bed at home, you know, just right. couldn't look at chess at all. I just felt like okay, I have to gather the energies because okay, we were hardly sleeping during the match. You know how it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wanted to get back as much energy as possible. On the other hand, because I think it's also typical if you are in a winning team, then you have all those great memories of this match and when you are on the losing side then you are full of anger and okay you have also so much adrenaline at the end that okay you understood that it could have also gone maybe other way but finally it didn't go well so i felt like okay here is now my chance to to play chess and let's try to show that uh, yeah that we can play very well mm -hmm. and i and i played very well in this tournament unfortunately it's a team event so I would have much more preferred that my team plays very well and uh, we get a medal, but we didn't manage to get even close. Finally, we came and we shared fifth place, but we were not, uh, not really in the fight for the medals. But uh, this gold medal on board one, of course, is a very special memory. And, uh, and I, played, I, played, you know, I played the very last game. 130, 130 the, moves, roughly about 130 moves against Zigalko. Exactly, but it was also such a surreal feeling because I knew that it's kind of very important, but the Olympiad is almost officially over because nobody was playing in the playing hall anymore, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they already started removing the tables, the chairs and everything from the big sport hall. Mm -hmm. And I'm still pressing this three versus two, look night versus look night end game. And I knew that I have to play it as long as my opponent just dies or falls from the chair. And yeah, at the end, I managed to manage to win that game, and thanks to this, I had the gold medal. Right. Oh, there are also other trophies. I'll just briefly mention. There is Tal Memorial in the middle, and uh, yeah, I mean, again, let me say this is just like twenty percent of the trophies which P Peter has in his house, but these are very important ones. There is another thing, Peter, I want to show uh, to the audience, and this reminds me of uh, actually this very tournament, the Tal Memorial two thousand six, uh, the one which you won. I was helping uh, Shirov there, Alexei Shirov, and uh, we met and Anand I think came for the Blitz event, if I remember correctly, and uh, there was a con conversation going on between Anand, you, me and my sister who was living in Moscow. And uh, I don't know if you remember the topic of the conversation, it was about visiting Taj Mahal in India from Delhi and as it happened, at that point of time, none of us saw it. Now we have all seen it, but at that point, it was like you were the only person who has seen Taj Mahal, and you are explaining us how from <laughs> then from Delhi your trip to Agra and how you saw Taj Mahal and so on. Uh, which brings me to the next picture. Peter has got in his house. He has got some fantastic chess sets. Uh, I here are some of them, and. Uh, the, the one on the left side corner at, at the bottom, this is the special Taj Mahal chess set, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, okay, this was so beautiful. I mean, first of all, visiting uh, Taj Mahal was, uh, was like a dream come true. I have heard so much in my childhood about uh, Taj Mahal. So when we had a chance, mm -hmm. and okay, how did I get the chance? I was knocked out from the... <laughs> from the World Cup. Oh, that time it was still a World Championship. Yeah, I was basically knocked out in the tie breaks. 
in the mm-hmm. World Championship by Halifman in a very, very dramatic uh, match. Mm-hmm. And uh, I still had some time before with my wife before returning to, to back to Europe from the championship. And then we thought like, okay, here's our chance. Uh, let's go. Mm-hmm. And then the embassy of Hungary, Hungarian embassy in uh, Delhi organized for us this trip. And they took us there by car and we, we spent some time there. It was just fantastic. And then we already felt like that's it. We are exiting Taj Mahal. Then just next to Taj Mahal, there was this uh, souvenir shop. Mm-hmm. And we happened to walk in there with, uh, with my wife, Sophie. And then we suddenly spotted this chessboard. I mean, it, it was so beautiful. And uh, we felt like, okay, we have to get this chessboard. So we had a lot of negotiations. It was, it was a very tough uh, call. And finally, the question was also, if we managed to buy it, then how will we carry it home? Because this is from marble and uh, it's extremely heavy. It weighs something like 13 or 14 kilos, just this, uh, yeah. both the pieces themselves are, of course, light. And it's not, uh, it's not painted. These are all made out of mosaic stones, all this uh, picture that you see on, I mean, this painting. So it's, it's a very, very special one. And it was some incredible fight to bring it home. But I said, okay, I have to win this battle. I have to have this chessboard. And finally, you see it's in our house. We succeeded and uh, we are very, very happy ever since. Uh, By the way, uh, after visiting your house, I was so impressed uh, seeing all these chess sets. I myself started collecting different kinds of chess sets. And now in my house, I also have lots of uh, interesting chess sets. So, yeah, so. yeah, I think it's simply as a chess player, for example, for me personally, I, I just love everything connected, uh, related to chess because it's, it's so nice. And I feel a little bit, you know, that it's, it's not nice that technology has gone so much in the direction that we are hardly able to work over the board already. Yeah, mm-hmm. we are always doing everything on screen. Everything is with computer. You are using all these engines. But uh, I respect chess so much that for me, chess sets, when they are special, I mean, they, they mean a lot. So I was very happy that throughout uh, traveling, then wherever we've been and then something nice we saw, then it was not the question, uh, how will we carry home? We will find the way. If you have the will to, you will find to bring the way. it home, then exactly. I mean, we had already something like, I think, uh, over 100 kilos in some events. Uh-huh. together with my wife and uh, you know it was like impossible even to imagine how we are carried it home but we finally succeeded right right uh peter uh about uh, two world champions i would like to uh, know from 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 you the first one will be uh, your experience with mikhail tal uh, you have an uh, you had a moment with him when you were young and if you could share that once again i have heard it uh, saying uh, you shared this in uh, I think just 24 so if you could uh, share the moment and what sort of impact you had with Mikhail Tal yeah definitely I mean okay this was a very special moment uh, first of all I was born in Subotica I mean Subotica this is uh, a former Hungarian uh, city which is when I was born it belonged to Yugoslavia now it belongs to Serbia uh, but uh, my father still lives there. However, this is next to uh, next to the Hungarian border, and Seged is like 40 kilometers away. Uh-huh. And I'm living in Seged, and I'm living in Seged since I'm one year old. Uh-huh. And it was very special that you know, in '87, just half year after I learned to play chess, there happened to be an interzonal tournament in Subotica itself. Uh-huh. I mean, it never happened ever since, and it did not happen before, but exactly at that moment, it had to happen. So probably it was by no way coincidence, it had to happen. Uh, so I just learned to play chess like half a year before, and I was getting very much into it. And uh, okay, so there was this tournament, okay, let's go and uh, let's try to collect the autographs. However, it was very crowded, very difficult to park, you know, outside the, the city hall where it was played. So we kind of got there a little too late. And uh, okay, I'm very angry because it was not clear that we will have another day to to come back. And I'm running towards the stage, but the games have just started. And uh, and Mikhail Tal uh, saw that a boy is running towards the stage, you know, like Mm -hmm. uh, like running for his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started to play the game. 
uh, arbiter came and uh, like pushed with his hand. I mean, signaled me that no, no, you cannot enter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, that's it, finish. I mm -hmm. missed the chance. And then uh, Tal saw this moment, you know, and then instead of continuing his game, he's, he got up from the board, he came over to me and signed me the autograph. And that's uh, that was a very, very meaningful thing because I just always forever gonna cherish and remember how much it meant to me, you know, this moment. And, sure. uh, and that, that actually uh, throughout the people also say that, yeah, I'm always very kind with the people and I try to help as much as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever runs for autograph or asks me for autograph or whatever, because I exactly know how I felt at that moment. So it really right. impacted my life. Right. Uh, this also reminds me when I was, uh, when I visited uh, Riga, uh, when I was in Riga with, uh, and working with Shirov, uh, I, I knew that uh, Tal at some point uh, taught Shirov. So Shirov was like directly a uh, student of Tal. And uh, yeah, I was sitting in a chair and uh, working and then I, I was asking about Tal to Shirov. And uh, he was like, yeah, by the way, the, se the chair you are sitting right now, it was used by Mikhail Tal. It was his chair. He was practicing there and he gave it to me. I have it in my house. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I can understand. Yeah, yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other person uh, whom I would like to talk about is uh, Bobby Fisher. Uh, now, I, I know I have heard a lot of stories from you about Fisher uh, when, uh, when we spoke about him. Uh, like he stayed there for, uh, for a for, for quite a substantial period of uh, time at your place. Uh, if you could tell your experience, uh, Fisher's chest strength, I remember you spoke about, you know, how you would be sometimes he's like sleeping, but he wakes up and he makes a move and still that's the strongest move. So if you could share a little bit of experience of uh, Bobby. Bobby as a player, yeah. Bobby as a person, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it was a very special moment in my life. First of all, Bobby had been around in Hungary for many, many years already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always had this feeling that if Bobby wants to stay in private, he should stay in private. I mean, there is no question I would love to meet him, but I will never try to, to meet him uh, unless he wants to. Mm -hmm. And then just by accident, exactly, it's connected to this Australian trip because mm -hmm. there we met one Hungarian person who, who was already an older person and he was coming back every year to, to visit Hungary mm -hmm. and he happened to know Bobby uh, quite well and with this person we would always meet and then he was coming like for every year and whenever he came he was telling that you know I met Bobby and we talked and so on mm -hmm. and he was every year like asking should I ask Bobby if he wants to meet you or not and I always told him no 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 if it does not come from Bobby himself then you should not mention me. And then suddenly uh, many years passed and 98 appeared, the year 98. I was getting, I think I was like around the top 20 in the world at that time. And all of a sudden there was this message coming that if I want, I can meet Bobby. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we met and uh, okay, some, I believe that Bobby very much felt like, wow, there is a person who doesn't want anything from him. That was kind of the, the most important thing, you know. And uh, after that, we got very, very close. Mm -hmm. uh, he understood that I'm there for him if he, he wants company, but I will never push myself. And uh, slowly we got closer and closer. Then later he also visited me in Seged. And yes, uh, of course, he would never so-called train me or something like this, but he was in the house. So he was also very curious how I'm training. So, okay, I was working over the board, you know, and I was looking with my computer and Bobby would sit in front of me. Okay, not participating in the analysis. I'm working alone, but he's sitting there. So it's already something special, yeah? And then, okay, sometimes because I would be working very long and then he would fall asleep. It was also very hot summertime. We did not have AC and uh, it's like 35, 40 degrees in the room. So he, he fell asleep. A couple of times and I continue analyzing, checking with the computer, checking over the board. I like to work like this, that I'm using uh, my human brain, so-called, over the board and also compare with what computer is saying. So I'm working, working, always constantly changing the position. So it's not like Bobby is like trying to trick that he's sleeping, pretending to sleep. And while he's pretending to sleep, he's thinking, no, because 
situation was constantly changing. And whenever he woke up, you know, he looked at the board like, okay, what is this? Ah, this is the position. And he sucked all this position like within a few seconds into himself. And at the same time, his hand would move out and bang, smash the best perfect move on the position with a clear vision. I mean, I was like stunned. I was so happy that I, I witnessed this because previously I already felt like, of course, we are the young new generation. We are using computers. I mean, we already have so much information. Those old guys, yeah, they were very strong. They were something special, but uh, now the time has passed. And then that I got this chance of experiencing it firsthand, what it means to be Bobby Fisher. I mean, this was uh, this was fantastic because, uh, like this, I know exactly that yeah, Bobby was just something incredible. Uh, would you say uh, uh, your chess also uh, got a new perspective uh, because of Fisher? Partly, like uh, he 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 was there for like one year, right? Almost. Yeah, I mean, not constantly in my house. I was also non-stop traveling. I had many training camps with Vichy at that time. Actually, I was working with Vichy also a lot <clears throat> during this period. He would be traveling. But yeah, whenever we uh, we had time together, then we would come come together. But since we never really trained chess together, I would not say that his chess influence was, was big. It was much more, I think, psychological that... Uh, you know, you are together with Bobby. He was telling me so many great old stories. At the same time, uh, he would also see that, wow, he sees that I'm very good, you know, and then all these things uh, boost your confidence. You mm -hmm. are like, okay, if, if Bobby is satisfied with me, then probably I'm not, uh, you know, then I, have a, I can succeed, you know, and it, it gave me a lot of, uh, lot of boost. I mean, uh, definitely. And he was also showing me some old analysis, which he, he did. I mean, it was also like shocking in his old times, but back in the 70s, he was able to analyze without computers so deeply. So it was also like a very interesting uh, experience for me that I got a chance to look into the way he's thinking, right. what he was thinking back then, because, okay, then later he was already not uh, really uh, playing. And he was telling me because he saw also the way I'm working that but okay, Peter, you cannot go on like this forever. This is very, very tough. I mean, that's why you have to play the Fisher random chess, right? Because then instead of all this crazy preparation before the games, you go for a nice walk. You might go to the swimming pool in the evening. You can relax and you will be always fresh for the game, you know? And then later, of course, things got even escalated even more with computers. And I very much remember all these words that he were Bobby was telling me that, yeah, I mean, how nice it would be to be, to be fresh playing a chess game. And to be honest, I can't recall when was the last time that I played a chess game uh, that I felt that now I'm fresh and I'm looking forward to this game because of these tons of preparation and everything that you have to do yourself. And before the game, it almost feels like that you give uh, like 60, 70% of your energy in the preparation for the game and you hardly have any energy left for the game itself. Right. Uh, by the way, uh, talking about energy, uh, many people, uh, they're simply not aware about your fitness level, the, the kind of fitness level you had when you were younger. Uh, I know you were playing football literally at a professional level uh, when you were rising at top. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about your fitness and football, and I would also like you to share uh, your the famous match with uh, Schumacher, Michael Schumacher, the, which was played in the stadium. Uh, I saw the video, but I today I tried to search an article. I could not get a photo or video, so I, I am unable to show it to the audience. But at least we can uh, get to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, okay, football was like... Uh one of my main things. Uh, for example, football, I started at the age of five mm -hmm. and uh, immediately, and chess, I started when I was seven years old. So basically two years later, and I was already very serious about my football uh, skills. Uh, the only problem was that, okay, in football, you have to wait till you get physically strong mm -hmm. because otherwise if you are small, okay, you can be very talented, you can be very good, but okay, maybe you just push your side and that's it, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why suddenly my chess uh, development was of course much, much faster. But on the other hand, I mean, whenever I was not playing chess, mm -hmm. uh, let's also not forget I was not going to school. 
-hmm. So when I was like nine years old, yeah, nine, nine and a half, I uh, got uh, I got out of school. I mean, simply the director of the school offered me that since I'm missing so many classes because I'm traveling to tournaments, to trainings and so on, mm -hmm. then let's try with me to make exams every half a year instead of uh, going to, to the school. So thanks to this, I got a lot of free time and I was traveling all around the world, but whenever I had time, it was football time. Mm -hmm. So usually my daily routine when I was training on chess would look like that I'm playing, I mean, I'm training like eight hours chess and two, two and a half hours football. I mean, this would be usual uh, scenario. So football was like every day, uh, daily, I mean, it was part of my daily life. And then usually it was also like this, that in Seged there was no chess. Uh -huh. So I had to travel from Seged somewhere to have the trainings. Uh -huh. And But whenever I would come back to Seged, then all my former football colleagues, with whom I was playing in the clubs and so on, were playing indoor football. Uh -huh. And uh, like from the age of 11, I started to professionalize myself because I could never go to the big football trainings. I was not, not here but I could always go for the indoor matches. So basically I was playing like four or five times a week uh, indoor, uh, indoor football and on the weekends, if I was at home, indoor football tournaments. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why my level was actually quite good. And it was improving, of course, improving, improving, but also at some point, you know, because when I was maybe like 10 years old, I even gave interviews in uh, Germany that, and also in Hungary, in my very first interviews, one can still find that I want to play in Bayern Munich chess club and football club at the same time. This was like my dream and I was like 10 years old, you know, giving all these interviews. Then I was like around 12 years old when I realized that this is not going to work uh, because uh, simply in order to be very good in one of them, you have to choose and you have to professionalize yourself. So yeah, chess became of course my, my main and football my big uh, hobby. And uh, okay, I was playing really a lot. And then suddenly after playing the World Championship match against Kramnik in 2004 in Brissago, uh, yes, I did not win uh, the title. I mean, it was just one last game, the draw was missing, but okay, it was just a fantastic uh, <coughs> match in itself and an incredible achievement. And this match basically brought me national celebrity status in Hungary. And then I, 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 I would just like to I would just like to interrupt here. I have been to Seged. I have uh, walked with Peter in in the streets of Hungary, and I know what kind of popularity Peter has. Everybody knows him. Yes, Peter, please go on. Yes, and then okay after this match, basically like next year there was this former one because it was like a traditional thing that Schumacher because he loved football so much he would always make a charity football match uh -huh. in all these former one Grand Prix events. And uh, the one in Hungary, which is always taking place, the Hungaroring in, uh, in July, uh, I was asked to be the captain of the Hungarian All-Stars team. Of oh, course, it was yeah. also a very special moment. And they told me that, yeah, I will be the one who will be sharing the flags with, uh, with Michael Schumacher. Of course, uh, incredible legend and everything. I mean, we were always watching the Formula One races in television like, like crazy. And I have also been so much in, in Germany in my childhood, so I knew exactly who Michael Schumacher is, that this is something incredible. And so I was very, very excited. I also knew that M Michael is a fantastic football player himself. He, is playing in, uh, he was playing in Switzerland in, uh, in club. He was participating in training, so on. And the whole match is supposed to be taking place in the Hungarian National Football Stadium in front of 22,000 spectators. I mean, as a chess player, you are used to playing all this uh, world champion. I mean, I played the world championship final, but we never have this attendance. Yeah, people in the internet are following, but usually we have only a couple of hundred spectators in uh, in the venue. So having an event where all of a sudden there are like twenty-two thousand people cheering in the stadium and it's it's standing ovation when you are getting into the field. I mean, this was like a like an incredible experience, but. Even in this match, just like uh, two, two and a half months prior to this match, I got an injury. So it was not even a clear, I mean, it was not clear if I can participate in this match at all. But okay, being the captain and given the chance, I mean, I felt like, okay, no matter what, I have to play in this match at, at all costs. 
And then before the, the match, they worked on my injury like for one, one hour, the experts. And they told me that, okay, now at least they can tell me that you can play without getting re-injured. And I did really manage to, to play that match quite well. I mean, not to my absolute maximum level, but, but uh, pretty good. And okay, this was like a fantastic experience. Right. Uh, before going to the chess section, there are two things I would like to uh, discuss. One is, uh, I remember in uh, Elista Candidates, uh, we played some uh, badminton and some disaster happened. I was leading with uh, Peter 14-0 and we were playing a match of 15. But Peter has got phenomenal energy. He can run for a long time. And uh, at, at this point, when he was 14-0, then he started bouncing back. And of course, some credit goes to Sophie, absolutely, because I clearly remember she was somewhere else. She comes to watch the match when Peter is like 13, I'm leading 13-0. I score one more point, 14-0. And then Peter is completely charged up. From 14-0, he beats me too. Beats, he wins the game. So, uh, Peter, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Sophie and uh, her contribution. Uh, yes, absolutely. But before we go there, I mean, okay, let me just because you mentioned this encounter in badminton with each other. I mean, this was for me also an ex extremely uh, nice moment. First of all, I already qualified myself in the candidates tournament. So this was at the end of the tournament. Yes. So I was in a very good mood. Then I was playing some table tennis, which uh, kind of... Uh, we also played table territory. tennis, yes. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of my uh, uh, the territory. But on the other hand, I always loved badminton, but I never played uh, badminton in uh, in a tournament situation. I, I even didn't know the rules. And I remember that you were extremely professional. I mean, you knew everything and I knew that I can fight, but I didn't got the chance to fight at the beginning. And then you just crushed me completely. And uh, I was already about, yeah, of course, okay, what can I do? I mean, you are just much better, you know what you are doing. And then Sophie came over, that's absolutely right. And okay, I just felt like, okay, at least I have to get one point. Yeah, because I mean, it's not nice to lose 15-0. I mean, okay, actually it doesn't matter, but still, okay, we are chess players, we are competitors. I mean, we, we want to fight for our honor. So I started fighting for my honor. And I even felt like at the beginning, you know, that since Sophie came over, you kind of uh, were too, too correct, you know, too, too polite, and you did not want to crush me 15 0. You gave me a couple of points, and uh, I had this feeling. And then suddenly I got into, into the rhythm, and all of a sudden I suddenly started to play quite well, and I realized that you got nervous, right? And I, I ran out of energy also. You were just running like a robot at some point. <laughs> Yeah, and okay, I used to play a lot of squash. So mm -hmm. basically, I mean, I can run so-called forever. I mean, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I will not be tired or I will not be able to continue because I'm tired. Such thing did not exist. I mean, in my childhood, for example, I was able to play six, seven hours uh, football on the ground. I mean, without any break. I mean, okay, maybe like every one hour for 20, 30 seconds, I would drink quickly water and then continue. So this was never the problem, but simply that you were just so much better. And then, yeah, you got nervous and then I even managed to win this, uh, this set. I mean, after all, we only played one set. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this, was, uh, this was just a very nice feeling because I, it was the only badminton game I ever played and uh, it, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And yeah, now back to Sophie, of course, yeah, I mean, Sophie had been always uh, standing behind me, I mean, supporting me with everything throughout my chess career. I mean, we met for the first time during the tournament in Dortmund in 99 when I uh, became, not, not became, when I won the, the first uh, Super Tournament in 99. And uh, then we got married one year later in the year 2000. She was studying in Germany, but then stopped her studies, moved to Szeged also to support fully my uh, chess career. Then also later, one year later, her father moved, Arshak Petrosian, a great grandmaster and a fantastic chess uh -huh. coach, moved to, moved to Szeged as well. And it was also a very, very important uh, step in my chess career because then Arshak was here in Szeged and we could train like six, seven, eight hours a day with each other and it gave me a lot of, lot of confidence, so I think the big jump that I had like in this 
period of 2000, 2000, 2002, which led me to become the candidate uh, for the match against the challenger for the Kramnik match. I mean, this was also connected very much with this very, very intense war. Right. And that we were like a big, big part. I mean, a real, a real family was standing behind me to, to support my, uh, my uh, chess career and to, to get better and better all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let's have a look at uh, some of your games. Uh, before before starting, okay, uh, for the audience, this is Black to Play. You can, you guys can think uh, what Peter did here. Uh, Peter, you have been playing at top level from very early age, and you played with uh, Pete Kasparov or Anand or Kramnik or Magnus Ivanchuk. Name any top player. You have played so many games with them. Uh, yet I, I, I know few things like when when I'm going through all your games uh, one knows that we won't find many games where there are a lot of sacrifices and messy positions and you know uh, I remember once even while training you you even told me that you don't believe in attack uh, so ha, <laughs> I clearly remember this <laughs> we, we were analyzing something and I was going like h4 h5 and you're like no no Suri I don't believe in attack <laughs> but only those who have actually played with you, they actually know what is your strength and what is your standard. I mean, you played at uh, highest level. So how did you manage to stay at such, you know, at such a top level uh, without actually sacrificing anything? Like there are not many games uh, one can find where you are sacrificing. But on the other hand, I can find hundreds of games where you are outplaying positionally the very classy players, be it Kramnik or Carlsen or Karuana or Anand, there are there are moments when they are getting outplayed. How did you develop this style? And just before you answer, there is one more thing I remembered from our conversation that you always told, uh, you, you told me when you started playing chess, uh, you had the first lesson you were taught is, Peter, always look for what your opponent is threatening. So, <laughs> so, so if you could tell about uh, your style and you know how how you develop this kind of thinking. Yeah, it's it's very funny because okay, my father is a <coughs> complete amateur chess player, but uh, I mean really without any knowledge. He he never learned any opening. He doesn't know anything, even the names of openings. Mm -hmm. But uh, when uh, he taught me to play chess, and that's how I learned to play chess on the beach in, uh, in the Adria coast in uh, August uh, 86. Mm -hmm. Just uh, my, my birthday was on 8th of September, so just one week or 10 days uh, prior to my birthday, 7th birthday. Uh, the point was that I was already always looking forward to the football matches in the evening, but we were on, on the beach. And it was very hot during the daytime, so of course my family, my father, mother, my brother, older brother, wanted to enjoy the sea. Mm -hmm. But I was somehow afraid of the sea, so I did not want to go swimming. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for the evening to, to play football. And then uh, my father suddenly discovered this idea that I'm following some people playing chess on the magnetic chess boards without knowing the rules. So he realized that, aha, maybe this is the chance to get some freedom during this holiday that my father will tell me the rules, and once he tells me the rules, I will get busy with following this uh, chess chess games there. And then when he showed me the rules, he was actually during these first uh, uh, hours of not training, but when he showed me the rules, he was giving me this one advice there. My son, Peter, I mean, always look out what your opponent wants to do. So when I went there to, to look at uh, the grandfathers and saw the people playing uh, chess uh, on, on, with this magnetic chessboard on the beach, then I was already, you know, following that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Who wants to do what? Yeah, with each move. Yeah, that was like the, the, the first thing that came to my mind. And then, okay, I got the chance to play there my games. And I immediately won some games. And it was like a shock for, for everybody there that, okay, I'm probably just tricking them that I just learned to, the, to play chess because, okay, I'm already uh, not blundering anything and I'm, you know, having control of what is happening. Okay, it was very funny. There was even some big mess there. Uh, and then uh, that's why people asked me when we came back to Seged that am I already going to the chess club or not because people thought that, yeah, I have a special gift and talent. So, okay, that's about this... Uh, always watch out for what you should be doing then. Second step was also that uh, in Hungary, we didn't really have many chess books. 
And one of the chess books that had an incredible impact on me was the lessons of uh, Tigran Petrosian. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way he was describing this, uh, this book uh, was just, in English, the title is Legacy of uh, Tigran Petrosian. Uh -huh. I mean, this, uh, this book I was like reading maybe 100 times is an ex exaggeration, but I mean, at least 30, 40 times I did read this book. And all these chapters and the way he was describing how he plays and why he plays certain decisions, it was very close to my heart. I mean, this is exactly like I wanted, you know, to have all this control, to feel all the finesses. I mean, before your opponent knows what he intends to do against you, I'm already ready for it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm already like three steps ahead what my opponent might want to do to yes. me at all. I mean, this is the usual way of thinking, but of course, later you also realize that uh, you are learning and you are getting deeper and deeper in chess. So you learn different type of things like dynamics. Uh, the point is, I believe in attack, but I believe in justified attack. I mean, so I believe in it that I first put everything correctly. And then if I place everything correctly, the attack will come to me. And I don't have to force the attack somehow because that I'm not believing in. And whoever attacks me, I believe that, okay, I will simply handle because it's not sound, it's not correct. So why, I mean, he's attacking me, this is childish. I mean, it's clear that I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna be able to handle it. So sometimes, you know, during my career, I was sometimes shocked by my opponent who actually attacked me and I was thinking that I will be able to handle it and I was not able. Uh, for example, one of the games comes to mind when Lotier beat me in uh, 97 Ubeda. I mean, this was some incredible game. He just crushed me, but it was a fantastically played game. But uh, such games are very rare. Uh, they are very rare, and usually I always try to make sure that I'm having control of the position. And slowly, if I have control, then basically I can outplay anyone. Yeah, Just give me a position <laughs> with control. Uh, Rahul Srinivas in the chat uh, made a very valid point. Uh, he quoted you. Uh, it seems somewhere you said, the most satisfying win for me is when no one knows what mistake my opponent made. Well, today when I was seeing uh, some of the games, I don't know if you'll have time to see all the games. Uh, like for instance, you beating uh, Adams in 2002, that we will see. Then uh, beating Fabiano in white 2013. There are so many games where it is actually very hard to pinpoint what opponent uh, did wrong. They are just getting slowly outplayed. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. <coughs> uh, by the way, Peter, it also reminds me of uh, our uh, our collaboration in uh, Team Anand. When we were working together for Anand match. Uh, and there were so many openings where only we two were seeing. And this was a fantastic thing. Like uh, I would be trying to attack ruthlessly. And you will be refuting. Then we would get some sort of uh, balance. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. I mean, I enjoyed very much uh, those trainings. And yeah, whenever we trained, it was, I think, a very nice mix because all these different aspects of the games were involved in the analysis. Yeah, right. I mean, it's 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 very nice. And they, I think it's very important also when two people analyze that they have a little bit contradicting styles because uh, you try such moves which, you know, for some reason, the other one would not try alone because he might not believe in it uh, but once you get the perspective from the other guy that you know okay he believes in it and then you take seriously and then you realize that aha uh -huh, there is much more to it than you you felt at the beginning that's uh, that's very very nice uh, peter the funniest email i have ever got from you like uh, nothing can beat that so this happened after uh, i think uh, in Ka in qatar masters 2014 <coughs> final round i'm playing against salem Salim. I had a very decent tournament. I think penultimate round I lost to Mamedayarov. Otherwise, uh, I was winning that. If I would have won that, I would have been playing Magnus on top. But I lost to Mamedayarov and then I'm playing uh, final round. I'm playing with Salem Saleh. It was completely wild game. I am also attacking. He is also attacking. And okay, somehow I won this game. After this, I get an email from you. <coughs> and okay, Salem is your very good friend. We are very good friend. And it, in this email, you write to me that you are following the game. This very wild game, and you don't want anyone to lose. Both of our, uh, both of us are your good friend, so you are desperately looking for some kind of perpetual, and none of us were willing to do it. I was trying to attack, he is trying to attack, and at some point you felt it is not good for your heart or health, 
So you shut down your computer. <laughs> exactly. That's that's how it was exactly. I mean, I just couldn't believe what you guys are doing. I mean, why are you doing this to me at all? Of course, I'm following this game. Yeah, I, I like you both. I mean, with Salem, uh, we had... Uh, cooperation and okay he's a very very nice person and very close friend you the same and then you guys are playing against each other completely messy game i mean there should be a way to end it in a perpetual check or something yeah but no way I mean, even if the perpetual will exist none of you guys want to give it yeah it's not yeah. not your character you just want to it's already a funny position you want to play it till the end but I mean, for me, both of you mean a lot. So yeah, I just yeah. couldn't take it. I told myself, okay, now it's enough. I will go biking. Once I get back, I will check the final result. Yeah, I, I remember in, in that particular game, my king, at, on three occasions, uh, I allowed him to give me discover check. And like in a game, three times to give discover check. So you can imagine how, <laughs> how horrible the situation was. Anyway, getting back to the game. Uh, <coughs> We will just see some moments. We will not see the entire game. So, Peter, the first move, yeah? When you played King B8, you had some deep ideas in mind or it was just a prophylaxis? Well, I mean, first of all, I was just very happy with my position. I felt like I got uh, got my setup. First of all, it was the first time that in this tournament, it was the Dortmund tournament 95, that I played the Ningzo India and Queen's India and Vix. I never played it before, so mm -hmm. I was kind of quite excited and I did not know what to expect playing against the very best players in the world, some new opening. Mm -hmm. But here I was kind of completely confident because I have things under control. I like my position. I believe that I also understand this position. I was simply waiting for him to, to show his cards. King b8 is definitely very, very useful. Right. And then after King b8, okay, e4 happened. Uh, you played e5. <clears throat> and now, uh, sorry, uh, you, played, uh, you played king a8. So basically, king a8, the idea is, okay, you want to play e5 but after d5 you want this square yeah exactly yeah so yeah, king that's, a. that's the point yeah and now breaking here okay white wants to break and as we know peter the first thing he asks is what my opponent wants and then stops it and now basically okay that that i stopped long ago <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I, because I knew that I knew that White will sacrifice the pawn with C for C5 because Badiev is a world class player, mm -hmm. so definitely he knows that I want to occupy as you also show 90, 97, 96 and get the C5 spell, and then black is perfect. So if already he goes for this position, he believes that thanks to the sacrifice of with C5, he gets a very nice compensation, and I had to make sure that all his peace sacrifices connected with this pawn will not work. And once I calculated that everything is just in time and it's perfectly coordinated, then I was ready to play this king a8 and end right, this right, right, because you have to calculate c5. This is his own. He cannot allow the knight to c5. And now the oh, next, course, yeah. next phase of coordination. Immediately, the knight takes a better square. Yeah, because the point, the point is that the position is extremely tricky. If I play something like knight bd7, then white has ideas with bishop a6, mm -hmm. followed by knight takes a5, and he might just mate me. Mm -hmm. And so I need my knight on b8 very much. On mm -hmm. the other hand, I have to watch out that, for example, here the next move, knight takes a5, b a5, rook b5 will not crush me. So that's why this knight a8 was very, very important. Right. And here, you, have, here you're, uh, how it doesn't crush you here, by the way? Okay, I guess I have knight d7 now that he sacrificed. Knight d7 and then you just go here. Yeah. Yes, then I go there. Yeah. So he plays f3, knight d6. And I like uh, the next two moves also. You first play f6 just to make sure no no tactics here. And position is very solid. And now white doesn't know what, what how to create any kind of chance. He goes rook h1. And this is the next move that I really like. Another classy move. King to a7. Um, yeah, those moves are like, yeah. yeah. And then bishop a6. Bishop yeah. a6 just I mean, this usually this is, this is always very tough to decide that is this now a good defensive bishop, this bishop on b7 or not. But I felt like it's very important also to, 
to, to clarify the situation because I would love to get my knight to a6, but mm -hmm. it's even better if I exchange the life per bishop first. Yeah, it's, it's very counterintuitive because, I mean, uh, generally speaking, we would think this bishop is good and this bishop is uh, bad. But actually, uh, this bishop also doesn't have any future because the pawns are kind of completely stopping. This bishop doesn't have any uh, any good square. Yes. And finally, you got your knight. So now I got my knight. I secured my king because now, once he was bringing his bishop to f2, I had to make sure that I get knight a6 because otherwise, maybe some sacrifice on c5 with knight bc, knight takes c5. Mm -hmm. That's why I also wanted to eliminate this light square bishop because then I also have this c5, c4 uh, fork with the queen on d3 and knight on b3. So he will lose another time, mm -hmm. and I can already make good use of this. Yeah. And finally, when only when everything is under control, now you crushed him on uh, king side. Yeah, you know, it, it was also the point that after this tournament, because it was a very big success for me, I finished in a plus score in uh, at the age of 15 in the super tournament with Kramnik, Karpo, Vila. Wait, you were 15 years old when you played this? I was, yeah, exactly. I was 15. I was uh, becoming 16 a uh, few months later. Right. And okay, rest of the game is not so important. White is completely losing here uh, with this king, and uh, Peter won this game effortlessly. Yeah. Finally, who is attacking who? Yeah, yeah who is attacking who? And you, you got your attack. Yeah. All right. So this one is. Uh... All right. Yeah, you know, also there is now that I was commenting with Chess24 and I saw all this uh, advertisement for uh, Magnus's video for attacking without sacrifices. I felt like, hang on, wait a moment, this is my territory. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is how I felt also. I mean, why not you attack without sacrificing? I mean, it's much more pleasant and much better for your heart than, you know, you sacrifice something and if your attack doesn't work, you have to design, yeah? Well, there, there is only one problem, yeah? One needs to have that kind of technique and understanding. Of course, yeah. It's, uh, it's is, not easy, yeah. It's not, it's easy. not easy. It's a mastery in itself, yeah. yeah. There is a reason why this episode name is called Maestro. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, this game was also very uh, important, right? Like, I think you had to kind of... Uh, it was important for you to qualify for the for the match uh, against uh, Kramnik. I mean, this win helped you. Yeah, I mean, this was the last game of the group phase. And right. we had a very, very <laughs> tough group phase with uh, with Modosevic, with Balayev, with Mickey Adams and uh, myself. Mm -hmm. So, everything was very, very close. Mm -hmm. If, for example, this game ends in a draw and mm -hmm. Modosevic managed to beat Balayev, mm -hmm. then suddenly we would have ended up in the situation that all of us is shared mm -hmm. and a rapid new uh, tournament would have started in a rapid chess to determine the, the places, uh, the, the two spots from the four players. So after winning this game, it was clear that I definitely qualified. Finally, Balayev, by incredible luck, managed to been a completely lost position against Modosevic. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to this, then we both qualified with, uh, with Barrier. Right. We got some moves. Pranav Anand says knight d3, knight d4. Diptan Ghosh, who is a grandmaster, he says g4. Uh, well, first, yeah, first you played knight d3. So this knight is going here. And I really like the plan uh, here. How did you come up with this idea? Was it move by move or, or already you had a concrete strategy when you played your following move? Well, I think that uh, already before you started to show this position, I already kind of had a, a clear strategy because this rookie to rookie one was right. already played with this knight dc knight before intention of putting mm -hmm. the pressure on the d5 pawn. Right. Because then I force him to, to complete passivity. Mm -hmm. And then I just have to make sure that now I... I start to to kick back his his only strong piece, the knight on e4. So basically, now if you play f3, there is uh, knight g3. So you go slowly, yeah. You first play g4. Yeah, it's even not slowly because after g4, it's straightforward. I want to go king g2, f3, king g3, h4. Yeah, exactly. I mean, once you get this grip, 
And once after G4, it's even clear that he has to go back with the knight to F6, then thank you very much, because his counterplay with knight C4 will also never be available. Right. So bishop D7. Uh, okay, he's trying to come here. Ah, but bishop B5, you have rook E7. So he plays king yeah. F8. And H4. Now you go for this pawn. Yeah, exactly. And of course, this time you don't want to change the bishop. And uh, this is also important, yeah, like your next move. Uh, Peter never misses such things. <laughs> yeah, okay, because there is no reason to hurry, yeah? Yeah. Also, the rook c4 is threatened, yeah? Yeah, I mean, everything is under control, but still, one had this feeling that ac is missing from the position, yeah? Then, okay, let's make it. I have time. I have everything under control. I cannot do anything. Right. And now the king comes back. His job is done. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, why this uh, game became so famous was that uh, one would have thought that this position will still will be tortured for a very long time. But in fact, uh, black loses this in like five or six moves. And that came as a total shock to everybody. Yeah. And I also like like this knight, which was on, uh, sorry, uh, which was on e5. It came here, here, and now it makes another journey. Yeah. Because, okay, now the f5 square is, is just too nice. Yeah. Basically, I mean, I, I have been seeing your games uh, as a child, literally. like, uh, And always one gets this impression that uh, whenever you're winning game, it's like, you know, complete whitewash. Nobody understands uh, how they are getting slowly outplayed, but they are somehow getting slowly outplayed. No, because they make some inaccuracy in the opening, you know, this is the point that, I mean, they give something to play, I mean, for me, something to play with. And if you give me something to play with, this is already more than enough for me. Yeah? Just give me this very little. Yeah? Right. I mean, I don't need much, Yeah, just some very little. Of course, the, the problem was also that people adjusted. Or I was playing like against the world's best and so on. They also understood the kind of how to how to play against me. And uh, then things were not so easy. And because my chess style was based on this pure uh, improving and outplaying my opponent, my opponent simply made sure that they don't give me a chance to outplay them. Mm -hmm. And then on the highest level, you are seeing a lot of draws. And uh, after, you know, making a lot of draws, then I was criticized like I'm only drawing or whatever. I mean, I never had any intention in my life to play for a draw. I mean, I just play for my game mm -hmm. and I want to improve it while I'm playing for advantage with black of course I'm happy to equalize because okay simply I believe that it's white's job to to try to create something from from the white side mm -hmm. and then I had many blows and this was then difficult psychologically because once all the chess board started talking about ah Leko is only draws 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 mm -hmm. then it put additional pressure and you know then you already not only have to deal with your opponent and all this, but even with these things that what people will say after if you make another draw. And exactly. this I felt like it it was uh, like some very big extra pressure later on. Mm -hmm. But uh, during my career, there were these periods when I was very, very strong. I managed to overcome this very nicely. But there were also moments when it was a little bit affecting me. Right. Uh this game, okay, uh, I know this is so famous that uh, everybody, uh, most likely everybody knows this. So I will just quickly show what happened uh, and then I'll ask you uh, how you found this. Because I remember when this happened, uh, this was played in 2004. Uh, we were having, uh, the Indian team was having a training camp in uh, in Calicut for uh, for uh, 2004. That is Kalvi Olympiad. For, for Kalvi Olympiad, we were training in Calicut. Uh, Ubilava was our trainer and uh, we all were seeing uh, these games uh, live in general. So I remember like you were coming down to time pressure and Kr Kramnik was blitzing out every single move and then you found and you know back then the computers were not strong. So when we were seeing live even then it showed white is winning, white is winning and then queen d3 comes and suddenly black is winning. <laughs> so watching this game live was... Uh, it created a huge impact on all of us. So let's go very quickly. AB5, this was uh, Kramnik's idea. Or, uh, to be precise, it was actually Swidler who came up with this. 
and the whole idea was based on this queen sack which i believe they found at the last minute yeah exactly i mean we know we have been seconds ourselves that you know it always feels like uh, you have all the time in the world but you have to work on so many different variations mm -hmm. that by the end of the time you maybe get into some critical position which you even feel that it's critical but you run out of time and i'm pretty sure that if Svidla would have had at least one two minutes to check this position then if this mistake would never have happened Absolutely. i actually don't know don't know exactly how it happened but it could easily been that you know he just saw that we had some intention with white i mean for example kramnik uh, and that was leading to a draw and then all of a sudden Svidla might have seen that you know computer shows that there is an alternative okay i already don't have time to check and to my mind it everything came together because if i would have not spent so much time already and right. i was all not approaching time travel mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure that kramnik would have been much more careful but sure. like this that i was getting into time travel he just remembered that aha uh -huh, yeah what he was most probably intending actually leads to low but now i have already hardly any time let's try to bluff me with this idea you know mm -hmm. but the point is that this idea i have foreseen long ago and it was by no reason no way the reason why i got into time travel i had some completely different problems exactly mm -hmm. in the variation which kramnik thought that i would be able to draw you know it was very funny yeah, so and uh, after he he took this risk, I mm -hmm. knew that Queen D3 at least guarantees me draw. I because mean, you saw uh, this, yeah, like A7 check here, King G1. Right now you're one uh, one rook and one bishop down, but it at least gives you a draw for sure. But in reality, it is actually mate. Yeah, this this I have even seen that this is this is mate. I mean, there was one other line which was more complicated. Mm -hmm. I think if instead of king, ah no, then if he gives the queen in a different uh, different way, yeah, right. exactly. That was the line that because here queen DC, I I just couldn't believe my eyes because to my mind, I felt like I'm winning and uh, okay in the worst case scenario, if I'm missing something, I have a draw, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was. It must have been an incredible shock for Kramnik, and this knight x60 was, of course, very, very important because uh, let's not forget I had something like uh, two minutes without any increment on the clock. So oh. if there is still some intrigue in the position or something to calculate, then it, it's still tricky. But uh, this is a straightforward win. Right. And then I was also very pleased that after he played a7, I even could play h6. Amazing. That was very pleasing. Yeah. Just to protect my G5, yeah. well, of course, the position is anyway winning, but it's very pleasing to be able to make such move. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, okay, the next one. Uh, again, uh, we'll just see only some moments. Uh, this is against uh, Judith uh, in Tilburg, uh, 1996. So, yeah, when I was selecting some position, I just wanted to show some particular moments and show the technique like uh, which is again those who have played with you those who have gone through your games uh, they are perfectly aware about your techniques there could be many plans in this position i mean one can think yeah like uh, we have the open file uh, we have the knight here you're following three moves uh, it it makes a great impression like first you go g6 yeah, well, you... to, to be fair, I mean, I consider this position as a winning position for black. Uh, usually, you know, those people who, who analyze with me for the first time, they are a little bit shocked in over the board analysis when there is some slight advantage for, for one side and I already say, okay, this is losing, mm -hmm. or this is winning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because for me, basically, if I believe that I can uh, clarify that this position is slightly better for me, it basically means that I have to win my game, we have win this game. And if I will not win it, I will be very, very angry with myself. And here in this moment, I have this incredible powerful knight of d5. Mm -hmm. So I have to make sure that white is not able to disbalance it with any rook f5. So instead of invading to the second rank with rook e2, which allow, allows something like rook f5 maybe, I'm not interested on this. Let yeah, it's, 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 it's six, exactly. Six. I mean, imagine there is rook f4, rook e4, rook c4. There are so many active moves, but the first thing Peter does is control this square so that, that this knight is secured okay so he plays rook f2 he stops uh, rook invasion on e2 and your next move also f6 
Yes, stability. Stability, yeah. just bringing the king. Okay, yeah. brings the king. Judith stops uh, the c5. And now the time to enter. Change one rook. Change the active rook. So that after take, there is no, no rook, b, rook b3 kind of thing. We just change one rook. And now we see, now everything becomes clear suddenly. Now this knight can never be attacked. There is a very nice majority. This bishop is not going anywhere. This rook is not go going anywhere. And once again, you win pretty much effortlessly. Yeah, I'm just enjoying the advantage thanks to my knight on d5 and that's it. Yeah. And I enter with my king, yeah, make sure and white is hopeless. Brilliant, brilliant technique. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she resigned uh, after. Yeah, also, okay, of course, I knew that Judith is extremely dangerous in any attacking position. So, uh, and also if I get a better position, but I give her a chance mm -hmm. to, to try to get counter play, she will use it immediately. So I had to make sure that, you know, I'm controlling everything, uh, not to give her any counter play. And uh, then I managed to win convincingly this hand game. Right. Uh, the next one also, certain moment of your game. Uh, did you see the tactics when you played bishop d3 here? Because, for instance, bishop g2 is also a very standard move. But uh, when you play bishop d3, there are moves like queen c8, queen h3, what happened in the game. So did you already spot the idea when you played bishop d3? Yeah, of course. I mean, basically the whole point is that bishop d3 is an incredibly ambitious move. And, yeah. uh, it's very counterintuitive, if I may say so, because, I mean, okay, suddenly this pawn is not attacked at the moment, I mean, thanks to queen takes e8, but this bishop kind of uh, left the king, also left the pawn. So, it's, it, it, it is a move that doesn't come immediately in the mind. Yeah, well, to, to be honest, I believe that uh, in this game, I felt like I should have won this game earlier already. Mm -hmm. I was quite angry that I gave my opponent uh, counterplay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I felt like this is a very critical moment because if uh, I very much wanted to win this game. And uh, in this sense, I had to be already super precise. Mm -hmm. So I forced myself, you know, not to be, uh, in fact, influenced by this fact that is it safe or is it not safe if i feel that this is the best move and it requires perfect calculation then i have to take the energy it was actually a last round game i have to take all this energy to it was also time travel phase i mean usually when i move 27 i was already in, in time travel mm -hmm. and uh, i had to i had to calculate everything and i did here already also sure. i mean knowing you i can uh, i can only guarantee how much uh, accuracy, how much effort you must have given to check again and again that this is the move. Because given a chance, you, would, you will never play something like this. But... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. But, I mean, as I said, I had to win this game at all costs. And uh, already things were getting out of control because I was afraid that if he just gets some purely technical position or I give him some counterplay, then he might escape thanks to his powerful knight. Mm -hmm. So I have to be very energetic. And yeah. I have to use his back rank issues. And uh, G4 is, uh, yes, yeah, strategically, of course, a terrible move. On the other hand, he's pinned all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that's why this move is justified. Yeah. And then suddenly, uh, okay, he doesn't want to change all the pieces. So he goes back. And now... Now that finally you got uh, the control of e5, this bishop finally returns to its place. And immediately, like, this is also such a Peter Leko move. Just getting out of uh, all kind of trouble. Yeah, okay, but it's, I think it's, it's sensible to get out of trouble, yeah? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, but the, I mean, s there are certain things which comes to you so naturally. I mean, we can see like in every single move, even now, yeah? Thank you. I don't want any trouble. I don't want you to attack me. I will first stabilize my position. And only when everything is done, now I will attack. Amazing yeah. game. And then and then here, I think I missed rook takes f7, you know, because I was in terrible time trouble. I ah. was so happy that finally I 
stabilized everything and I felt like I'm completely winning and Magnus pushed A4 and I instantly took B and I said immediately, of course, once you take the pawn in your hands, mm -hmm. you realize that, of course, uh, okay, you are missing all these things. It's just, uh, just completely crazy. Yeah, and then Magnus moved out with, with Queen B8. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, but then you are winning. Yeah, I'm winning, yeah, because I have force in that uh, I'm winning, but it was like a shock to, to me because you know, usually these things happen for a second, but here he played a4, I took b a4, and he still played c4. And only once I played king h2, you know, because he has queen b1 check. Uh, can you go back to that one moment? Because uh, this was very important. Yes, yes, of course. Hang on. Uh, yes. yes, so. Just to go back to this position, mm -hmm. because, you know, after b a4, I noticed that, you know, go back after b takes a4. Mm -hmm. Once I had this pawn in my hand, mm -hmm. uh, I immediately noticed that I blundered, look, I could win with rook f7 on the spot. Mm -hmm. So I took b takes a4, mm -hmm. he goes c4, and, uh, you know, if you go rook takes f7, now he has queen b1 check already. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. That's <laughs> why I had to play king h2 that, you know, I... And then he has I, queen b8. Yeah, then he has been B8, but okay, what to do? Yeah, okay, but the position is winning so much that you won uh, just purely on technique. Yes. So, uh, this game is also very interesting. This was played very yeah, this recently. This is against Nihal. Yeah, this against is against, Nihal, yeah, yeah, this is against Nihal Sarin uh, from Isle of Man. And, uh, you know, I always felt it is very important also for the young players to to be able to play with uh, with uh, much stronger players because uh, let's say a game like this will always teach these youngsters uh, a lot more than you know winning against some weaker opposition so i think which is what also you had uh, at your young age right you you could play with lot of strong players and then you make one tiny mistake and then they beat you and then that's how you sort exactly. of you, you kind of grow yeah you kind of grow as a yeah. player so such games always teach us a lot yeah, I remember, I mean, in this uh, middle of 90s, as the youngest grandmaster, I was given the chance to, to play against very established world-class players like Yusuf Ato, Yusuf Ob, Viktor Korchnoi, Predla Nikolic, I mean, all these guys, Anatoly Karpov. I mean, when, when I played against Karpov and he beat me in 94 in Dortmund in a masterclass. I mean, it was such a pure genius that uh, genius play. I enjoy even now when I think about it that what a lesson I got from Kramnik, yeah. uh, I mean from Karpov, sorry, uh, there in this game in, in Dortmund because that was just fantastic how he beat me and it was connected uh, to the fact that in 93 with White I managed to make a draw against him. Mm -hmm. So I think Karpov was very unhappy as a fantastic world champion, the legendary player that all the newspapers were writing that the 13 year old prodigy or at the age of 13 made a draw with him. Yeah, right. it's Anatoly Karpov. Mm -hmm. So when he next time put the white pieces against me, I mean, he just, I, I believe he took all his his energy and he just wanted to play a masterpiece and, and it was a masterpiece and I learned so much from that game. Right, right. Uh, this game, actually, I was also seeing live in uh, Isle of Man. And uh, again, your next move, uh, of course, once uh, you make it, then it is very obvious. Uh, I, I could have chosen some other moments also, but I thought this is quite instructive uh, in general. It immediately, it does, it feels like, okay, white is better, but it is not very obvious how much better white is. Because black does have some attacking prospect. Uh, this bishop is doing a fantastic job because there is no knight f4. How did you come to this move, rook a1? Yeah, rook a1 was actually a very, very important move and a very tough one. I, I believe I spent quite some time <laughs> I mm -hmm. also felt like uh, Nihal is uh, creating some uh, dangerous counterplay, you know, because he's about to play some bishop g5, mm -hmm. trying to change my dark square bishop and uh, getting access to the f4 square. And I don't want to capture knight g 5 mm -hmm. because, uh, okay, it's not entirely in, in my plans. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I have to be very energetical, not to give him time to, to create any counterplay. Uh, let's, and let's, 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 let's. Let's let's just understand. You wanted to be very energetical. That's why you played rook a1, yeah? Exactly. Okay. To, and the point is to stop any counterplay. So rook a1 is that's why so strong. I want to go b4, b5, mm -hmm. uh, create this very strong pass pawn uh, on the a file, 
also keep uh, keep an eye on the a5 pawn and i i really want to push b5 so how, please tell me how rook a1 stops bishop g5 um, well i mean and now probably we'll just take and play b5 immediately yeah just take it with bishop and then no no if i take with the bishop he'll, he'll take, take with the pawn he'll take with the pawn he will take with the pawn yeah yeah maybe i g mean maybe g3 even yeah Maybe G3. I mean, what did he play? He played Rook F8. Yeah, he played Rook Bishop F8. Idea. Ah, and then you played Bishop E3. Yeah, then I played Bishop E3. Yeah. I mean, somehow there was some very big nuance in here. I felt like Rook A1 was super deep, but you know, I mean, I spent so much time with it. Now, if you ask me immediately, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. But there was a, there was a reason why he he did not play Bishop G5. Right. Because he felt like Rook A1 had an effect. Yeah, it had an effect on and him. it's a curious moment because he plays rook f8, and after bishop e3 he goes rook e8 again. So maybe he was he, with rook f8 he wanted to do something, but uh, somehow he changed his mind. Yeah, I think that he wanted to be able that you know because b5 was a threat, and mm -hmm. now if I don't play bishop d2, I play b5, then he goes knight c5, ten to and goes ah. f5 with counter play. Right, right. This was his point, and so that's why you started with bishop e3. Now you want to play b5. There is no knight c5. Exactly. Yeah. Now I'm doing this. And all of a sudden, already it's too late because I want the tempo and I'm able to play b5 and now rook e b1. Actually, black's position falls apart. Yeah. And now suddenly you start attacking on king side. Yeah, I'm coming from okay, but this is the point of having the space advantage. Yeah, then you can regroup much easier. And yeah, suddenly all my pieces make perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah, this was just a disaster for Black. Huh? Yeah. <clears throat> all right, just a few more games. This is also one of my favorite game. Uh, you have got so many games with uh, Rajabov where you won. But uh, this one, I think, is uh, when I saw this first time, I was also playing this particular line. Uh, which year? Yeah, this was 2006. Yeah, 2006. <laughs> and this this was, uh, you know, uh, one of my model games for this line. And this idea which you played, this I kind of like. Was it your preparation? No, no, it was not preparation. The point is, on the other hand, that, you know, Sveshnikov used to be my main repertoire mm -hmm. uh, till like 2005 and uh, suddenly in this line I was encountering problems so I analyzed a lot with the white pieces with the black pieces and does not matter how much energy I was putting the white was somehow always pressing right. and of course now with the super engines somehow black can always exactly neutralize all the all the pressure and it's exactly draw but Back then, engines were kind of helping you in the analysis, but not solving the problems themselves. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I kind of felt the position very much. I think that after H4, this bishop F4 was kind of a big surprise for me, but uh, I understood the spirit. And this was always one of the way I was thinking about chess, that uh, it's very nice to understand <coughs> the essence of the positions, because then even if your opponent comes up with a new move, then it's not like, ah, what did I analyze? But you say that, Ah, okay, so my opponent played a new move, but I know what this position is all about, and I'm strong enough to find the, the right idea <coughs> over the board. Okay, I'll quickly ask audience uh, uh, what what move they would play here. This is white to play. <coughs> and uh, talking about your preparation, uh, Peter, uh, once again, this reminds me of one of our conversation where I was uh, completely taken back with the kind of memory you have uh, when we are talking about, uh, you know, if we talk about something like 96 Linares uh, versus Ivan Chuktopal of some games, yeah, you are immediately there and you have got phenomenal memory. This I have witnessed when it comes to opening, when it comes to games. And I asked you uh, during one of this Anand camp, I asked you that, uh, Peter, uh, you know, how come you have got such a phenomenal memory and you understand such this? tiny bit of details of everything <clears throat> and your answer i will never forget this in my life you told me surya i don't attack i don't sacrifice i should have something good no to stay at top <laughs> there should be something good right <laughs> <laughs> peter how did you uh, like from childhood uh, how did you said about petrosian but uh, how did you develop this kind of uh, understanding in general and what did you 
recommend to youngsters uh, to develop this kind of fine positional sense? Well, I mean, uh, the memory issue <laughs> comes, I think, also uh, it's connected with the way Hungary and uh, chess is uh, working. I mean, usually the, the such thing like Hungary and chess food does not exist because mm -hmm. there is no such thing. But it, it is true that there is this so-called uh, attention to the openings, to the details of the openings in, in all the Hungarian chess players and in chess coaches. Ferenc, Ferenc, Almasi, if we go back, Ribli, Portish, yeah, there are, <coughs> there, are, there are many, there are many. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everybody was really good in, in their openings and they were very precise. And one of my very first coaches with whom I started working at the very early moment, I mean, he, we did not really train much and he didn't really have much of an influence, but he, I do remember that he was like telling me that, you know, in your repertoire, write not just the line, but mm -hmm. the reference game that you have in mind, who played it, where and when. So it was like automatic that, you know, you say that, okay, this is the game played by this and these players, for example, Bugoino, 1978 for example yes yeah, something you write and then automatically your mind and okay i had from the beginning this very special mind for for all these things but it also got developed right from the very beginning that every game was connected to every position to to some game and then i know that aha of course these guys played it very where they played it when they played it why they played it i mean there was always a history behind everything yeah. and this made me it was much easier than to, to digest the material. It was not just, you know, that, aha, these are opening lines. It's like uh, opening lines, it's chess history. It's uh, trying to get into the minds of the players who play these games. It's, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And that's why I also like to gather all kinds of information and everybody, you know, it's, I like to talk with my opponent after the game, even if I lost that, what happened, what he thought about this game. And, all this, all this information are stored uh, deep inside in my hard disk, yeah? I mean, <laughs> in my inside hard disk. Right, right. So in the meantime, yeah, I see they are saying G3, G4. Uh, well, Peter had a very deep plan here. He played knight f5. So first of all, to take care, there is no bishop h6. And now G3 is threatened. Rajabov plays G6. And he comes back. So the whole point was to provoke black to play g6 the rook is here and then we play h5 at some point and now uh, in order to s prepare for h5 raja plays king g7 which also means now the bishop cannot come back here and now peter changes the plan and goes for this bishop so now okay if Black takes, then uh, it's just uh, Black is left with this h6 uh, bishop, which is very bad. And once again, we see it's not even clear. Like you made last few moves with knights, and suddenly Black is in very deep trouble. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I already felt during the game that I'm almost searching for wins forced wins here but uh, this f5 and getting the king to h6 was a very principal way so mm -hmm. it was uh, it was a good practical chance from from rajabu and now this was also a very nice idea this was very nice because black was planning to go somehow for this 97 bishop b7 d5 typical right. svashnikov counterplay and uh, this pawn on h5 can be strong and it can be weak in the long term. And also the big question, will I ever castle short, but then new dynamics appear on the board. Right. So I wanted to keep this king on e1 and the rook on h1 as long as I can. Yeah. And now the knight moved. Okay. You are starting again slowly. Yeah. It's like every time the plan is changing, like it felt like this rook will come here and attack this guy and Raja overprotected this. And now you are saying, okay, fine, you uh, you overprotected this pawn, but I never promised that I will come here. Let me change my plan. Exactly. <laughs> now exactly. I come for yeah. this pawn, yeah? It's like, and suddenly the exit, uh, the, the entry happened at most unexpected area. Like, just imagine, yeah, you, you open h5, 
then you targeted this pawn but your pieces finally entered from a completely different direction yeah i have to also say that in my mind uh, rajalov played very powerfully in this middle game so he was trying to put uh, maximum resistance and pose me uh, problem so i had to be very very precise unbelievable very nice games <clears throat> okay. And no, the go till the end, go till the end, because this is exactly what I meant. You know that I like tactics, I like to attack, but uh, the tactics should be, you know, played from strengths. And here after rook b5, knight f6, I mean, I always <laughs> had this tendency, you know, to finish a game aesthetically pleasing. Right. And this was for me very important. But uh, you know, I know that I want to be nice, but uh, I know that. I have to be very patient and I have to play a very nice strategic game to be able to finish in an aesthetic or nice way at the end. Right, right. Uh, actually the next game it shows uh, in my opinion it shows every single thing of your style. It starts with a fantastic novelty if I remember correctly. And this is uh, we are talking about 2002 that's Slo uh, Slovenia Slovenia Olympiad. Uh, yeah, Blood Olympiad. Blood Olympiad. This is also but very yeah, but you know, it was not a novelty. The point was that, yeah, Rook B1 was kind of still unknown in this position, mm -hmm. but Rook B1 was played uh, in the game Scherzer versus Peter Wells in 95 already in Hungary. Oh. Oh. So I knew this idea back from 95, you know, that this Rook B1 exists, but it was, back then it was not like nowadays that everybody knows everything. It was kind of hidden because Rook B1, if you look at the position, it doesn't... Uh, creates such a big impression that this is very important. But in fact, this Rook B1 puts Black in a very big trouble in this in this player variation. Okay, let's let's just get back uh, to what you said. It was played Selzer versus Peter Wells in some Hungarian tournament, right? Hungarian league, yeah. Hungarian team championship. Peter, who remembers like this? <laughs> well, I, I remember, actually, I happened to be happened to be in the same tournament hall, you know, that's what I remember. <laughs> what, what is going on here? I mean, if it was like, you know, something Karpo played against uh, Nigel Short or some other game, I would remember. Some Hungarian league, Selzer played against Peter Wells and that Rook B1 you are using here. This is uh, amazing. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, okay, but I was I was really happy, and this this game actually yeah, really highlighted the, uh, all the strategical uh, dangers for black in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this rugby one was very important, and uh, now nowadays, if I would ask uh, any youngster, they would immediately probably play rugby one because it is quite well known. The idea is after c six, we can play c four. We see the point of rugby one. This bishop is attacked, but the game itself is very nice and uh, yeah you're following two moves uh, also uh, i remember during this uh, uh, training session with anand number of times we had uh, we were checking some kind of prayer and we had similar maneuver and you were bombarding me with all this reference games and ideas subtle things so <laughs> i remember all these tiny details and yeah your next two moves uh, by the way, uh, Peter, somebody is asking, yeah, that's a good point. Pranav Anand is asking, if Rook B1, what happens if Black plays, you know, Rook B8 with the idea of C6? How do we benefit in that? Yeah, well, I think the whole point is that with Rook B1, you are not preparing C3, C4, but you also eliminate this Knight D5 ideas from the connected with the long cast, I mean, long diagonal. Uh -huh. And uh, once you step out of this, then you can already also use the same idea with Bishop DC C4. I mean, uh, because ah, right. you have to be ready to meet Black C6 with C4. That's the idea. Exactly. So it's uh, exactly. if he plays C6, then you go C4. If he protects his Bishop first, then you make sure that you Again. will be able to play C4 and, yourself. <clears throat> and basically, let's get this straight, that if we would start with Bishop D3, then after C6, C4, take, take, there could be some ideas like this. Yeah, and besides, even somewhere, this just the clean piece sacrifice was also uh, also possible in these uh, variations. Oh. If Black got a perfect version with uh -huh. Rook B1 right. included, it's clear that it will never really work so well. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, and this move, yeah, Bishop D3. Now the Bishop is heading back here so that this pawn is permanently protected. 
It's phenomenal how the attack developed and everything happened very slowly. Yeah, because it also looks like Black got a wonderful C5 outpost for the yes. for his knight. Yes. Yes, it's blue, but on the other hand, he has two knights, and uh, only one knight can occupy this square. This is one of the problems uh, Black is uh, having in these positions with with all four minor pieces on the board. If there would only be, uh, I mean, one pair of knights, I believe uh, Black would have maybe a different uh, situation. Sure, sure. <clears throat> And yeah, and this bishop a6 is also a big question because I mean, uh, one can argue that the bishop on e6 is such a lovely piece, exactly. piece and this bishop on g7 is, but exactly because he has these two knights uh, covering the c5 square, I cannot really make use of uh, of the c5 square for my bishop. Mm -hmm. And I feel that somehow all of black's pieces are on the queen side and he might want to go a5, bishop a6, or bishop a8 start trading pieces uh, and I don't want to trade pieces. So I have to create some trouble for black uh -huh. and I can uh, create the trouble against his king because he I have space advantage it's not so easy for him to to regroup and all his pieces are far from his king yeah oh by the way uh, thanks but Pad Padmini is in the chat uh, Padmini Rao thanks Padmini for reminding this I must tell because uh, probably Peter is not aware Peter uh, when Levon came to this show uh, at some point he said uh, we were talking about you and at some point, he shared a memory that uh, in some Rai Lopez, he played uh, uh, this bishop e7. And then after that, he played b5 and bishop c5. So he says, okay, it is. it was, uh, it was kind of uh, unique because normally you see bishop c5 to go to uh, uh, e7. But it was, uh, he played the game first and uh, it was bishop e7 and then b5 and then he played bishop c5. And later he had a training session with you. And he he saw that in your file it is mentioned as Leco system. So it seems he asked you like, uh, why is this Leco system? I mean, come on, Peter, I played this. How can this be Leco system? <laughs> and then at some point uh, you told him, yes, you played played it, but you don't understand it. So it is Leco system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's Bishop is and Bishop C5 was uh, basically I think ever since this in a3 anti martial this bishop c5 happened mm -hmm. uh, this uh, this was very i mean it had a big influence on me once i saw this for the very first time uh, maybe in like 2007 mm -hmm. uh, since then it was automatic for me that this bishop c5 going for the bishop c5 type of spanish is always possible and right. uh, then later okay level had the chance first time to to play bishop c5 but Okay, I had it on my agenda in all kinds of circumstances, this Bishop C5, <laughs> right. for many years. Right. Uh, so, Bishop H6 happened. And now, finally, when everything is under control, Peter goes for attack. Well, it's not even an attack because, okay, it's just strengthening the position, you know, because if it would be attack, I would have not played like this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, the, the spirit, you know, <laughs> because simply, you know, attack in my mind is something which is premature, that you are attacking when you are not supposed to attack. But here I'm just strengthening my position, man, don't call it an attack. The attack will come later, you know. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, now okay, again, you again, again regrouping, yeah? Huh? This knight d2 was for my, for me personally, the highlight of the game, and I, in my mind, I give it like a triple exclamation mark because otherwise h4, h5 itself does nothing. I mean, it looks you like go Black simply gonna play queen e7. He goes bishop d7, rook b8. I mean, uh, he has everything under control on the uh, king side, and he just activates his pieces, and he will have nice counterplay. Right. Uh, so why has to be very energetic and very precise? And when I saw this idea H for H5, it was connected that I'm in time with knight D2 because the knight <coughs> not only goes to C4 hitting the D6 pawn, but it opens the third rank for the rook with rook E3, I mean, which I mean, will actually eventually give the possibility to sacrifice the knight. So this is all part of a big picture. It's a concept. For, yeah? uh, uh, Peter, for, forget about the audience. First of all, I have to understand in order to explain to the audience. So. You you played h4 h5 with the idea of knight d2. This was the part of the plan, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
It's kind exactly. of. I mean, it's very important because you know, if he goes queen e seven, bishop d seven, bishop b five, and okay, gets okay. control of the c four square, then just the king side attack will never help you. You know, you cannot create there anything. So everything has to be perfectly timed. All right, all right, uh, guys. You you see, I am also having a very tough time here to understand. Uh, well, how... look at the game. You will understand. Yeah. Because I mean, I know the game. You know, as I want it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I know the game, but it is again very typical. Like uh, I never expected. Uh, even when I saw this game, I never expected that when you played h4, h5, you had ninety to knight c4 idea. It's uh, complete. Like you are coming up with h4, h5 with a very deep strategical plan. That's brilliant. Exactly. Okay, but that's that's my trademark. That's why I'm playing chess. <laughs> that's how I want to play chess. Amazing, and yeah, you finally the rook is also coming. As Kida Kidambi is there, so he's saying when he says strengthening the position, it was not a joke. Yes, Kidambi, it was not a joke. It seems. Definitely. And yeah, finally you win this game. Uh, Peter, if you have little bit time, I just want to show uh, two more uh, positions. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. I, I have a little bit more time. Okay, good, good. Uh, and those are also very nice memories, you know. This is <laughs> it's just the way you are showing me. I'm already getting uh, very nice uh, feeling and all these memories that yeah, I mean, how nice it felt making those moves over the board and uh, how much pleasure I was getting uh, from out of them. I, I can I can totally imagine. Like uh, also for me, actually making you know like uh, inviting all of you to the stream, it requires a lot of work because. Uh, how do i how do i find games and to show within you know like one and a half hours or two hours of a player of your stature i mean there are so many so i am going through okay there are players like setu is helping me kidambi is helping me to they send me their selection of games i go through hundred of games i read uh, whatever is possible and then try to find moments which will be very instructive and which are also very important uh, in your career like all this uh, important events but as a process i get to learn a lot too i mean uh, like also when judith came i had to see lots of games go through her books uh, in order to select the position i think i by now in last uh, one week i have probably seen hundreds of your games once again and it's it's phenomenal to to revisit these games of course i have seen these games uh, before also but uh, it just shows uh, the kind of uh, strength you have as a player it's it's absolutely tremendous <clears throat> i I'm, I'm not sure if i chose the right moments maybe uh, there were uh, even more finer moments which i did not understand personally but uh, for me these moments were also very uh, important yeah no this one you got it right okay in the beginning of the game i used the very important novelty mm -hmm. to to solve all my problems and once Alexei was not familiar with the position. He felt like he was a bit shaky. Then I already got, uh, you know, really motivated to, to try to get the maximum out of this game. Uh -huh. And uh, the move that I played here, I already played with a clear vision that maybe thanks to this plan, because I felt like I'm clearly better. Uh -huh. uh, on the other hand, you know, you have the feeling that you are clearly better, but how do you proceed in this position? Because uh, it's not obvious that uh, thanks to this, I mean, there are double pawns. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have the e5 square and you can claim good knight versus the bad bishop, but I mean, when you try to create something, white always has something. And when I find this concept of, uh, of the move that I played, I mean, I immediately felt like, yeah, this is what I need. I mean, this is what the position requires. And once I get the idea what I'm getting after this move, everything will be, everything uh, will find its own place. So how so you played here a5 in order to change exactly. this rook. Uh, what was yeah. the concept behind changing one rook? So did you feel like if you change one rook, your king is a uh, lot safer? Well, first of all, my king is uh, totally safe. On the other hand, I felt that the white king will get mated once I change one pair of rooks because then the back rank will be a problem. I mean, thanks to this uh, construction, it's not so easy to white to to solve this back rank issue. Uh -huh. And uh, this rook on f1 will be overloaded. And the move like hc, yes, it does uh, stop the backrank issue, but 
it doesn't solve the, the real problem of why that he is still in some kind of mating net. I think this is a very valid, I mean, when you explain, it's crystal clear that once you take off one rook, this rook is overloaded because, okay, it has to protect the, uh, it has to protect the, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it must uh, protect the king and also it has to do some other job. Now, suddenly it is uh, clear that this other rook which was on c4, that was doing a fantastic job. And uh, now, eventually, your, this rook will come into play and this rook will be overloaded. Yeah, exactly. These are also the kind of moves, like, once you explain, then it becomes elementary. But it's also possible, you know, not to find it at all. Yeah, yeah of course, because you might think more about forcing consequences. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, once, uh, once you played it and... Then it perfectly makes sense. Mm -hmm. I also believe that once I find this idea, I have this feeling that okay, I have all the chances of uh, trying to, I mean, to win this game. And we see Shilov immediately tries to go for Bishop H5 idea of taking my knight and taking the f4 pawn. Mm -hmm. But I never give him time for this because his king is in big danger. Ah, because ah, there is this very nice tactics. If you would play Bishop H5, then you play B3, and exactly as you said, yeah, like. Suddenly, this f1, these two rooks are missing, and this king is exactly. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. so okay, he plays this. His queen is eventually coming. And there is no perpetual. Yeah, it it required uh, precise calculation because it does feel like it shouldn't be on the other hand okay shouldn't be is not enough because if suddenly it is then it is, it is. but yeah I, I calculate it till the end that my king finally escapes beautiful huh. yeah i just walked till it and then yeah. it's, it's over Okay, uh, the last one. Uh, sorry, there is some, I think, construction going on just uh, beside my building, so there might be some disturbance. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I know this because our neighbor starts 8 o'clock in the morning, also some construction. So yeah, I mean, I know how it, how it feels, you know. Can you imagine when I'm, you know, that I'm sleeping late? So if somebody starts construction at eight o'clock in the morning, then I just die because it's just it's the time when I should be it, really sleeping. Yeah. Exactly, and to be honest, like I could never imagine that uh, in India, you know, like uh, at uh, nine forty it is now, and some construction was this uh, work will be going on at uh, nine forty at the night. So <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay, this is the game that I was talking about also. Like, yes, white has advantage. Maybe I should have shown the game a little bit before because there are very classy moments uh, in this game. But due to time construction, I chose uh, from this particular moment. It feels like white has advantage, obviously. I mean, this knight is doing great and uh, the rooks on B file, they don't have any entry. Uh, but the way you conducted this game is also phenomenal. Uh, could, you, could you share your yeah, thought process you know here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, the whole point is that whenever I get a position like this, I consider that strategically winning. So it puts also a lot of pressure mm -hmm. and I feel like that, okay, I simply have to win this position because otherwise uh, I'm betraying myself. So You're betraying yourself if you also... don't win this position. Exactly. Yeah, because, okay, I, I live for this. This is the way I think about chess that if you are better, uh, then you have to win. And I already managed to outplay uh, Fabiano because he was a little bit slightly inaccurate in the, in the opening. And uh, I managed to get this wonderful outpost for my knight on C4 that he cannot touch this knight. Mm -hmm. If he cannot touch this knight, then it doesn't matter that he has, he has doubled the rooks on the B file and he has a lovely square on B5 for his rook. It just doesn't make any difference for this position. So slowly, step by step, I have to build my attack going on the on the king side. And since I have all the time in the world, black uh, cannot create anything. Mm -hmm. I just have to make sure that I'm patient enough, so I should not be in any rush. Right, right. And uh, the way you conducted this attack was uh, 
extraordinary. So, okay, first rook f1, understandable. You want to open up here. How about now? How did you come to the conclusion for the next moves? Well, that uh, simply Fabiano was playing uh, very good. I mean, Fabiano was already, I mean, close to 2800. I mean, a brilliant player at that point. So <clears throat> clearly, he understood that he's in big trouble, but usually all these modern, very strong players uh, start to put incredible resistance once they feel that they are in trouble. So Absolutely. I I felt like, you know, I have to be super precise and I should not uh, let him any chance of, of escaping. Mm -hmm. Okay, attack is coming slowly and as you said, you have all the time in the world. So first you double on the F file. And now you switch your plan. Well, I mean, he also moved all his pieces to the king side. Yeah, he regrouped the knight to g6, moved the queen to e7. So he's kind of ready for all the action there. Mm -hmm. I had to be careful. Yeah. Well, in the chat, uh, also I see that uh, Bhaivav Suri said g3, Padmini also said g3, f4. Yeah. Now the next set of uh, idea. How to continue from here? This was also, I thought, very instructive moment because it's still not clear. I mean, yes, white is better, but uh, how to break through? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was not not an easy question. It's, it's not easy. Was, time was ticking down. Yeah, time was ticking down because I spent a lot of time in the middle game. And in the opening phase to make sure that I get the control. Mm -hmm. So I believe I had like max 10 minutes uh, for the rest of the yeah. rest of the time travel. And you know, like, okay, I, I saw the game also today morning. So when you see the game, you feel like, aha, of course, this has to be the way. But when you don't know, then it is not clear. Then it is uh, when you're playing over the board, you don't know whether this plan is correct or that plan is correct. Where do I put my pieces? Do I, do I put my knight on f5? Do I attack on g5? Do I go h4? It's like there are so many options. Yeah. Yeah, and when to go f5 is basically the main question, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, they are saying King H, Padbini is saying King H1 with some H4 ideas. Uh, Kusharga Sharma is saying H4, H5. Queen F3, Queen G2 followed by F5 and H4. Okay, interesting. A blindfold Chess is saying amazing Lekwa. I really like his commentary. Yes, when, when Peter explains it, and guys, I had the opportunity and blessing to, you know, uh, work with him. And when he is explaining an opening, it is like you will never forget in the rest of your life. Once Peter explains certain variation, it just stays with you forever. I remember when I went to Peter and we had, I had some lovely time, uh, Peter, in Seget. Uh, by the way, tell Sophie, please, that I miss the mint tea and uh, the fantastic cooking she makes and the lovely moments we had. I remember we played, uh, we played bowling. We played a very special game. I don't know uh, what is the exact name of the game. Uh, uh, this is somewhat like uh, you have to throw the pieces. It's it's in India. It is like carom. If you could tell the name, I'll again type. Uh, what is it called? Yeah, it's a shuffleboard. I mean, it's a Dutch game. The English uh, word I think is shuffleboard. Shuffle. Shuffleboard. Shuffleboard. Yeah, board. Shuffle board. Okay, shuffleboard. So this is the game we played, and. Uh, and also we played lots of bowling and I had, I had fantastic time in, in Seged uh, training with uh, Peter. Okay, but yeah, we also had fantastic, you know, we also liked you very, very much. So yeah, you had wonderful, uh, wonderful time. And you remember also that what we worked on, I managed to use in Vikansi against Ivan Sokolov. Yeah? Oh, of course. Was based, of based course. on our preparation yeah, of that course, we yeah. in Seged. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And very interestingly, even uh, Hari had the same position with Sokolov, but okay, he was uh, probably not aware of the exact same thing. Uh, and uh, I think Hari played Sokolov first, and then uh, you you played against him, and then you just completely crushed him uh, just out of the opening. It was a very yeah, interesting yeah. game, yeah. yeah. All right, so yes, uh, Vaivav Suri is right, Rook G2 and Rook G1. And now we want to play g4, g5, but before that, important to close. And here I think uh, Fabiano made the final blunder. It was uh, somehow important to play uh, knight h7 and go to bishop d8. 
he played queen d7 but this allows uh, immediate attack and this is this must be very crucial peter yeah like uh, uh 40th move to take uh, such a crucial decision yeah but on the other hand you know this queen d7 might be a mistake on the other hand he felt like it's move 40 mm -hmm. and if i'm not using my momentum he actually has a threat of somewhere maybe you know some look a to b4 and then queen b5 uh, yeah. attacking my knight on c4 and if i lose control of the c4 square then my position actually can fall apart right so also also it kind d7, of stops this yeah it kind of stops like yeah any kind of king h3 idea because of some kind of pin mm -hmm. exactly yeah so i i felt once he played this move queen d7 that uh, i have to try to use my momentum because uh, not that uh, i get too lazy for my move 40, probably I have like one and a half minute or something like this. Mm -hmm. And I make a routine move and after move 40, I will realize that I had lost my chance because of this lazy move. Right. Uh, so right. I, I really focused very much and then I spotted that, okay, I already foreseen it as well, but uh, I made sure that what I believe is the right move and I can go for the direct attack is really working. Yeah. Uh, by the way, yes, Kidambi, you are right. Uh, it was the Nimzo, uh, the Skarpov system B6, and where I think White takes Rook takes E6. Very amazing game. Just check it out. This is uh, Sokolov uh, versus Peter Leko. Waikansi, Waikansi 2000, 2011. 13, 13. 13, 13. No, 13. It's the same tournament like this game against Fabi. Right, right. <clears throat> so, Queen D7, G4. The point is, after Bishop H4, G5 game is uh, just over immediately. It will collapse here. So Fabi plays g5, desperate. And just no time. Very important to take with bishop because yeah, finally we are opening. Exactly. We are opening. And resigns. Again and again. So this is what I wanted to show. Like whether it is Carlsen or Karwana or Kramnik, you know. Attack happens, but with total control, total stability. This is uh, this is phenomenal. I could, uh, guys. I mean, I could literally go on for hours. Just you know, take hundred games of Peter and show his style of play and his powerful understanding of the game. Uh, but basically, these are the games that I selected for this particular stream. Uh, <coughs> Peter, before uh, uh, now, uh, towards the end. Uh, you worked with uh, Kramnik for uh, the Kramnik ma uh, Anand Kramnik match. You also worked for the team Anand. Your experience as uh, as second, both in Kramnik team and Anand's team. You have worked with so many players in general. <coughs> yeah, you know, I I just like to to work on chess very much, <coughs> mm -hmm. and uh, also I, you know, usually the players with whom I'm working, I respect them very much as players and as, uh, as persons. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, with Kramnik, I mean, after the World Championship match 2004 and also connected everything that was related to, to that match because the whole match was postponed for a very long time. The way Kramnik treated me, you know, like uh, I never had a feeling that uh, he has any other thoughts than to play this match with me. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, known before what happened between uh, the match Shilo and Kasparov. So I felt like it was very, very nice the way he, he reacted to the, to the match. We had an incredible match. And after that, I simply felt like when he asked me to, to help him uh, prepare that, uh, okay, it's just very natural because uh, I want to work with him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very nice guy. and. Uh, a truly special chess player. <clears throat> On the other hand, the only question was that it's exactly against the against Vichy Anand, with whom I also had very, very nice relations. And I have been working, okay, back like 96, 97, 98. So it was like 10 years back, or even a little bit more than 10 years back. And first thing I had to make sure that any of the material that I ever checked with Vichy, we are not to influence this match. And of course, once it was clear that no way, besides right from like 99, we stopped working with Vichy, we had very good relation, but I also entered top 10. Mm -hmm. And then it was impossible, you know, as a top 10 player to work with each other because we were 
every tournament playing against each other. Right. I remember that in 98, 99, 2000, it was very, very unpleasant for both of us. Mm -hmm. We wished to play against each other because we simply shared too much knowledge together. Mm -hmm. But later with the years, things have separated. Everything went, his, everybody went his own way. Everybody created his own team. Everybody had his own opening repertoires. So there was no more connection like this. So in this respect, this was for me the clear signal that, okay, Kramnik asked me, I can do it because uh, it's no harm for vision. That was very important because for me, this human aspect is always uh, comes first. Right. Uh, then, uh, then with Vichy, when I was asked by Vichy to help for his match uh, against Magnus in Chennai, that was already after I had worked for him, not as a clear second, but I did help in the preparation against uh, Boris Gelfand in 2012. So I was kind of already involved. You, you have been in the Vichy's team. We had also been working in a couple of things already back then together. So it was like a very natural thing that if Vichy trusts me and will ask me to help him in the match, then of course I will be happy to, to assist in the, in the preparation and also during the match. So it was no question. And it's always so much pleasure. You know, this is what people might uh, not really understand. But for me, it was never, you know, when I looked at Kramnik or Vichy or like this, I never looked at concurrents. I looked at colleagues. Uh -huh. And uh, I always kind of felt like, you know, having very nice relation with your colleagues is like essential part of, uh, of being a world class player. <laughs> Maybe exactly this uh, was not the right mindset when you want to become world champion, because when you want to become world champion, then maybe you have to put all these human aspects aside and, you know, you have to have this incredible ego that, yes, I want to crush everybody, I want to be the very best, you know, I want to be world champion at all costs. Maybe this was, maybe this was missing from me. Yeah, this, this was missing. On the other hand, I don't regret it because I got so much joy uh, by working with Kramnik and also with Vichy all those years that uh, I will never forget. Right. Uh, Peter, uh, there are, uh, I see Padmini and uh, Kirambi, Sethuraman, they are all uh, interested to know, will you write a book? I, uh, th there is a book, right? Your memorable games, but that's like really old. Yeah, and it's also not written by It's not me. exactly written by I you, think... yeah. We yeah, not, not, not at all. It was not at all. I mean, there is a chess book which uh, was in Hungarian, uh, so-called Chess Genius, mm -hmm. uh, before the match against Kramnik, mm -hmm. but it was never translated to any other language. It was just for Hungary. Then I have been participating and I have been analyzing my games. I have to say, certainly, I mean, I have so much desire to, to write a book. On the other hand, I'm not used to all these business things. Yeah, for me, just writing the book would be not a problem, but everything that comes with it, you know, you have to find the publisher, you have to negotiate conditions, I mean, all these things. This is, this is not my art, yeah? And uh, who knows, maybe I will start to do some video series, it, it might be easier, but I'm also open to, to writing a book, definitely. I feel like, especially now that I got involved with the commentary, yeah? mm -hmm. and I felt like how people reacted with how much they like the way I'm explaining and how much energy I'm also getting from all these feedbacks from the people. This encourages very much that you, you want to share. And also while you were showing these segments of, of games, I also had this feeling, you know, yeah, it's, those games are really it's so truly special and it's also so nice to explain because they are very educational. And I feel like in modern chess, especially with engines, now everybody gets all the information, there are all these moves, and computer is playing stronger than any human, but uh, why things are happening? And this is also the reason why I like to get involved into the commentary, that I feel like if the public is interested, that I explain why things are happening, then I want to do it. If public is not interested, I will also stop commenting. So it's not like I want to comment, that's why I'm commenting. I comment because I feel that the public likes what, what I have to offer and I love it as well. Absolutely. Peter, this is the very reason why I was asking for two episodes, but unfortunately you did not have time because I know like to, to be able to cover your great games, just this one hour or two hour is like, it's a joke basically. So that's why I, I was repeatedly asking you if, we, if I could get two episodes that I can get more games and you know audience could enjoy and we could revisit some really cool games because this is i mean what we saw today is just a tiny bit of uh, 
you know few moments from your great games there are there are just so many i mean we it would be wonderful if you could write a book like seriously yeah definitely i think it's just question of time i mean my heart is ready my heart is open for it i think this is the most important and uh, okay i'm also now in the i'm in the coach uh, i'm working as a coach of vincent kaimer this takes a lot of energy i'm commenting i was not playing myself in the legends i have many many things to do but it's uh, i'm really open for it and i think it's it's going to happen absolutely uh, to the audience let's let's uh, let's give a shout out for leko let's let's thank him for his uh, for his time and everything whatever he explained uh, let's show him respect and thank in the chat uh let me see what is going on yeah people are saying they enjoyed your commentary and uh yeah thank you very yeah. much yeah this is always very very nice right uh <coughs> by the way peter uh you have almost stopped playing you are playing very little uh do you consider uh after you know the lockdown uh, eventually the when the tournament starts would you start playing more and more Yeah it's a very tough question you know because once you are going in certain direction i mean like i'm very much into in focusing on coaching vincent now with the commentary once you have all these projects starting to appear then you have less and less time for yourself and uh, on the other hand you know i have this feeling that uh, if i play i want to play in a way that i know that i can play On the other hand, I'm not sure that uh, since I cannot devote enough time for myself, that I'm really able to play the way I can play. So that was exactly the reason uh, why before the Legends tournament, of course, it was such a great uh, feeling to be part of this Legends tournament. But before the tournament, just a few days before, I was still involved as a coach, and I just managed to buy this chair on which I'm sitting because I didn't have this before the Legends. Okay. It just. I bought it for the Legends tournament. I didn't have a mouse with mm-hmm. me because I haven't played online chess in the last ten, uh, fifteen years. Mm-hmm. So I was like absolutely not ready. So I got a mouse and I bought this chair. This was my only preparation for the Legends. And okay, <laughs> let's let's try to play good chess. I played one day, little bit on the on in the internet. I mean some uh, blitz games. Then I played with Vincent, and Vincent was telling me, "No, no, Peter, you cannot play like this. This is online chess. You know, here you have." To. I said, "Aha! Okay, I have to do this, this, and that." And each, and you know, with the mouse that I had, I could only make one move in three or four seconds because my mouse was shaky. Uh, the table was not ready at all. And okay, everybody can flag me any moment because. I think we can make uh, one move in 3 or 4 seconds. Other people can like cars and can make uh, 20 moves in 1 second. You know okay. I mean what kind of chance do I have? They're anyway even fantastic uh, players. So uh, this this was like the big question before the event but the way I settled in and the way I played I mean this part of when you look at yeah finally I took the last place. I was very very happy. I was very proud of my play and I got a lot of energy out of it because I felt like uh, the games that I produced uh, gave me the feeling that I can you know and this was like the most important message for myself that I still can I bounce back in so many matches all my matches even those that I lost were very very competitive and finally I had the feeling that I lost because of lack of practice not because my opponents uh, really outplayed me and right. this basically encourages me to to play on the other hand i also understand that okay if you are coaching and you are commenting then it's uh, very difficult to to really compete against the best guys but this legends tournament gave me a big big pleasure uh by the way uh, talking about uh, tournaments uh, olympiad is going on right now and uh, what do you think about the chances and also uh, you are working with vincent why is he not playing in the olympiad who i don't know i think that you know people think that vincent is like a professional chess player yes i'm trying to help him but he is he is not going to school he is right now already in germany school has started he doesn't mm-hmm. have all this flexibility uh-huh. i mean he has many other many other commitments as well uh, that's why i know exactly how talented he is because you know when we look at for example myself then I did not go to school since I'm 9 years old and it was clear that all the attention everything went to to my chess development that how I will become stronger uh, on the other hand in Germany Vincent has to go to school so 
Uh, his attention is divided and nevertheless, he's making incredible progress thanks to his talent, thanks to our work together. Uh, this is very, very important for me. And I believe that once Vincent will stop his school duties, which will sooner or later come to an end, then if he fully focuses on chess, then he has all the chances to, to become a very, very great player. Right, right. All right. Uh, thank, thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot for doing this. And uh, yeah, if you have time, I would love to have you for one more stream some sometime whenever you have free time. This was uh, this was amazing to see your games, to get the insight, to talk talk with you about various things. And yeah, as as the audience also says, like they would also love to have you one more day if you have uh, if you have some time. Just just let me know any any day any time if it works. Even if you have one hour, we would love to see some more games of yours. That would be wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I also wish you all the best. I heard that uh, you started in the, in the summertime, yeah, already in the middle of June or something, yes. and that it's a big success. Mm -hmm. Everybody is very happy, so I hope all the best for this channel. And yeah, guys, follow Surya because, okay, Surya is also an incredible person. I mean, a very, very nice person. I think that's also the reason why the top players are agreeing to do this stream with Surya because they simply respect, has tremendous respect for. For, for Surya, what he has done for chess with all these ideas, with all this work ethic and everything, and being a very friendly person. So I'm very happy that it's successful and wish you all the best. So, Thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, it was a long stream, but. Uh, Actually, you know what? Uh, I wish it continued for longer period and we could see uh, a lot more games. Uh, thanks once again to, to everyone, uh, especially to Kidambi, Setu, those who are uh, helping me with the games. And uh, to go through these games, uh, it take it take lots of effort, but I thoroughly enjoy it. And uh, to have these players, you know, come to the stream and uh, explaining... Uh, their thought process it's 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 fantastic and i hope you guys are also enjoying this and uh see you uh see you next weekend i'll i'll let you know who are the guests uh i can say kramnik will be coming but uh the dates are not uh, not next weekend so will i'll let you know uh the dates uh yeah. All right, guys. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Bye.